Yo, what's going on? Not here. Essentially, this week I've been working on a spreadsheet for my guild to help out with loot council decisions, etc. And I just wanted to share with you my thoughts on Phase 1 class prize for loot. I'll say it now, and I mean it. This is going to be a long one. If you're here to hear about every single item, get a drink and snacks, get comfy, put me on the second screen. We're going to be here for a long while. If you're looking for specific high profile items, I've noted a few timestamps in the description to make it easier for you. A couple quick caveats, and they're quite important to listen to before we get stuck in. Class priority is not the only metric worth using. It's obviously crap if Timmy gets to loot over Jimmy, but Jimmy is the only one attending raids consistently. Likewise, I don't know that Jimmy already has the second best item for the slot, and Timmy has a green. I can't know those factors, so we're just focusing on the single factor of class context. Importantly, this discussion is guild centric and looks ahead to phase two a little bit in some areas with min maxing both loot and performance over time. In short, this is through the lens of a pretty long term approach to guild management that seeks to be fair with people who are in it for the long haul. Also, a large chunk of phase one raid gear is from a 10 man raid. So accessibility is super high and you can reasonably adjust your Karazhan groups to fit the gear needs of your players. So don't get too stuck on class priors for 10 man content. At the end of the day, we will all will have done so much Karazhan by the end of phase one, probably on several characters that everything will work out as far as Karazhan loot goes. Of course, this is also just my thoughts, one person. I am by no means treating this as a guide, this is just a discussion based on the various things I have learned in seeking out a reasonable loot council aid for my guild. If you have any compelling difference of opinion with good logic, feel free to express it. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, some specs don't have a proper sim tool right now, and will not have a sim tool in time for week 1 TBC it seems. As such, there's some lesser reliability for those specs. If sweeping changes are needed later on once we have more sim tools, I will update this accordingly with a new video. By phase two and tier five priority, I'm pretty sure things will have you know, cleared up for that. So without the way, let's get stuck in with Karazhan, otherwise we're gonna be here all day. So first up on the Ataman loot table is the Harbinger bands and these can go anywhere. It's a really easy one straight off the bat. There are several better options from both dungeons and professions. This is an early candidate to be a void crystal, but essentially it can go wherever it's an upgrade. It's not an important item. Following this though, we have the hand wraps of flowing forts. And this is quite a big ticket item, at least loosely speaking, as far as 10 man raid loot goes, because even the specs that aren't huge fans of spell hit because they've got lots baked into their toolkit already this is one of the best slots to get that little bit of spell hit in phase one now the specs you're looking at to prioritize assuming everyone's min maxing and that is a big assumption i'm aware but if everyone's min maxing a lot of specs are going to be using the spell fire gloves that would be fire mages arcane mages your fire warlocks which are apparently simming the best out of destruction warlock specs at the moment and potentially even your boomkin so overall that brings us down to quite a limited scope of specs and i'll try and flesh it out as best as possible for you in particular shadow based warlocks are going to struggle for hit a little bit they're usually with an elemental shaman in their group but still have quite a big hit burden to get to because they don't have any hit from their talents. So with that said, you're probably leaning towards those shadow based warlocks because they're going to be doing the most DPS, like in particular the destruction warlocks. Affliction doesn't need the hit per se, but again, wants that little tickle of hit from this slot as well. So it's reasonable to put them towards the front of the priority also. Then you're looking at your shadow priests, boomkin, you're not looking at Elemental. Elemental has so much comfort with hit, they really don't even want it on this item, despite it being super efficient. So to recap real quick, 
pretty much shadow based warlocks followed by you know shadow priest boomy followed by any other specs you might reasonably expect to be using a slightly better option like spellfire gloves but don't like maybe they're not a tailor stuff like that then you get to those guys at least if we're being really strict next up we have gloves of saintly blessings now typically with a lot of these healer items we're going to see a big dichotomy between spirit items and mp5 items and the spirit items just lean themselves towards priests and druids naturally because of the regen implications here though these are just not competitive with the leather male plate options in phase one this is very much a priest priority item not just because priests have limited options just because there are hugely better items for leather mail and pal uh, leather <laughs> leather mail and plate sorry so overall it's pretty straightforward priest very distantly followed by druids that might need this and then shamans and paladins really should be looking elsewhere to be honest but we'll get to some items that they're going to be looking at very soon so very much a priest prior item here this is their bis for throughput brace of the white stag much like the Harbinger bands, these aren't too great. They're kind of feet, they're okay. They've got some spirit on, which might be relevant for your Boomkin if you've got one in the Karazhan raid, but they're outclassed by several options. An easy Void Crystal pretty early on. Now we have the Gloves of Dexterous Manipulation, and the first thing to note is that these gloves are pretty good and aren't far behind the infamous Grips of Deafness, the expertise gloves from trash that you might have heard from heard of rather now notably i found out that rogues do not use these or grips of deafness in their bis phase one setup according to sims they instead are going to be using the waste walker gloves for the two-piece bonus because they love hit just that much along with the shoulders hunters are also going to be using a dungeon set the beast or gloves all the way through to tier five so that really limits the scope of these gloves already. On top of this, plate wearers do have more options, so you're going to push them slightly lower here. And on top of that, we've got ferals and enhances that are somewhat interesting in these gloves. Again, these are good, but not the best. They're pretty strong. And of course, this is 10 mountain loot, so don't overthink it. Very loosely speaking, you're probably looking at your ferals and enhances, followed by the hunter, followed by, uh, sorry, not followed by the hunter. Hunter doesn't want these, followed by the plate wearers, and then your rogues hunters, because they're just not going to be using them if they're min maxing. Next up, we have whirlwind braces. It's a pretty good item, but is worse than a couple options for shaman and worse than several options for paladin. Simply due to the amount of better options, you're going to prioritize shamans over paladins. But either way, neither of them are going to be using this as their BIS setup. Next, we have the Stalker's Warbands. There's no need to even put a thought onto this one, to be honest. They are the fourth or fifth best option for most, below a couple easy to get blues. Again, a Void Crystal candidate pretty early here. Next, we've got Van Braces of Courage, and these are the best in slot mitigation braces closely perhaps a tiny bit worse than the braces of the green fortress which are a blacksmithing boe item but by and large these are there or thereabouts as the best mitigation option for both your prop tanks i'm not sure there needs to be a prior here whilst your warrior might be active tanking more often paladins are going to be struggling a little bit more in these early gearing stages so they kind of cancel each other out to pretty much an equal priority here Next, we have Gauntlets of Renewed Hope, which are fantastic, but obviously only going on your Holy Paladin. This is a good example of why the Gloves of Saintly Blessings are so heavily skewed towards priests, because for some reason, the other three healers just have vastly better glove options. Now, moving on to Wolgenclaw Necklace, and this is a very good neck. It's going to pop up on a few BIS lists, but the issue here in terms of being too strict is that quite simply there's a badge neck that is almost identical like genuinely so wherever you put it people can't be too upset because they can very easily go out and get 
pretty much an identical item from Badges of Justice. So whilst it is a great item, you do not need a class prior here. Just go for the biggest upgrade or whatever other metric you would like to use. We've got Spectral Band of Innovation now, and this one is more of a catch-up item, early Void Crystal kind of candidate. There's several better options, particularly from dungeons, even vanilla has better rings for throughput, at least, or DPS, than this one. So put it on the plebe geared guy, or just, you know, make it a Void Crystal, it's really not that important. Now, Steelhawk Crossbow is an interesting one. It's not BIS for Hunters, or as a stat stick even, for Warriors or Rogues, but clearly, it's a ranged weapon that's epic, that is pretty good, and, you know, you're going to want quite a few Hunters in your 25-man raid group, and you might get unlucky with something like Sun Fury Phoenix Bow from Prince Malkazar. So, it's not bad, but you're probably going to want to put this on a Hunter that... If you're running multiple hunters, that is, in your Karazhan group for some reason, you would try to split them if you could. If that is the case, you're going to put it on the one where you're, that you wouldn't want to get the first Sun Fury Phoenix Bow. Maybe they're not as reliable, maybe they do less DPS, whatever your you know disposition is. If you're really nitpicking, you would put it on the, you know, the person who's not going to get Sun Fury really quickly. Outside of that though, Warriors and Rogues both think this is a fine, decent range stat stick, but it's pretty similar to a green you can get from quests, so really don't ever give this to a melee over Hunters, even if the Hunter isn't too keen on picking it up because they think that they're not going to get a better weapon because of this one, it's still far more valuable going to that Hunter. So this moves us on to more rows now. And the first item is Royal Cloak of Arathi Kings. Now, this one's pretty strong. You're looking at, quite clearly, your plate DPSs and as well as your Enhanced Shaman. They get quite a lot of value from this cloak. It's not the best cloak they have available to them. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky because, obviously, a lot of my assumptions here are that they are your, your group, generally speaking, your guild, are going to be maybe min-maxing quite a bit and this leads me to talk about vengeance wrap vengeance wrap is essentially a crafted epic cloak which is the best option for pretty much all the physical damage dealers that are looking at this cloak and a few others as well it's pretty much no primaries a gem socket with a nice or a red socket rather which is quite valuable with a little bonus on the gem socket bonus rather and just good crit in AP stacked onto it. It's really competitive, essentially the best cloak outside of the world boss cloak. So when it comes to this kind of item, it's a tricky one if you're min-maxing. You would have an expectation that Vengeance Wrap is being crafted, but if you are on a slightly you know, less aggressive scale, there's maybe not as many Vengeance Wraps, maybe it's week one and there is nobody to craft Vengeance Wrap, for example, you're probably looking at obviously your plate DPSs here, but Enhance can use it really well also. As a sort of third or fourth priority, you could also put this on your prop warrior, not only for off spec, but they'll probably be able to squeeze this into a threat centered set if that is necessary, or if they feel the need slash are comfortable with where they're at in terms of living. Next, we've got the Shadow Cloak of Dalaran. Now, there's a lot to say about this cloak, but I'm going to try and reduce it down as quickly as possible just to try and trim some time on the video. There's a very similar crafted blue cloak, which is one spell damage less and has no stamina. So you do have to use that as a contextual thing when you think about how important this is. It's not a huge important item. Now in terms of the profile of the item, i.e. high spell damage, no other secondaries, this is leaning towards these specs that don't scale very well with hit or crit. There's a number of cloaks and available in phase one for casters, and essentially your Affliction Warlock and Shadow Priest are not getting a lot from hit or crit. They use dots at this stage of the game. Affliction does move on to Shadow Bolts later on, but initially it's going to be casting only dots, which can't crit, 
Shadow Priest can only crit via Mind Blast out of their entire rotation. And in terms of both, they, they have talents that make hit really, really easy. So they're in the market for a high spell power, no secondary kind of cloak. But as mentioned, there's a crafted alternative which is super close to this, so don't think too hard. But if you have to discern on class basis between specs, you are looking at Shadow Priest Affliction Warlock. Next up is the Nether Shard Girdle. It's decent, it's really not competitive, it's nowhere near the best options for anyone who can use it. The spirit is best served on a Shadow Priest or Boomy, but that it would be a disservice to like give them this and then use it against them, if you know what I mean. It's not a great item. This is an early Void Crystal candidate. Next up we have Edgewalker Long Boots, which is the first timestamp slash highly contested item. And it's pretty hard to distinguish this one um, because it's BIS for quite a few specs and there are some contextual elements that you know make it a little bit more unclear, at least to my mind. So first and foremost, let's talk about what specs really want this. You're looking at Hunters, you're looking at Enhancement Shamans, you're looking at Feral Druids, and to be honest, it's not too far away from the best option for your plate wearing DPS too. So ultimately, you've got a situation where there's a lot of interest here, but there are some contextual factors as I mentioned. Hunters and Enhancement Shamans have access to Fiend Slayer boots. Now, these are not as good as Edgewalker Long Boots. They're just not. But they're not far away. They're not crazy far away. And as such, Given that you want to try and utilize loot as best as possible, it's awkward to give hunters a prio here, for example, because you know they're your best DPS usually, and people keep clamoring for this idea that, hey, prio your hunters because they do the most damage. That's gonna be correct in a lot of areas, but here it's a little bit more awkward because of the existence of these mail boots. The same can be said of enhancement. You'd be happy to give these to your enhancement, but you know, Fiend Slayer boots have to go somewhere in those early wicks where you're trying to stretch all the decent loot across everybody. So for, to my mind, those go down a little bit in terms of the priority, even though they are very worthy candidates. In terms of the plate wearing DPS, there are Iron Striders from Nightbane, which are better. They're not a crazy amount better, but they are better. So in that respect, they're gonna be the bottom priority quite considerably. You'd want your mail wearers and leather wearers to get these ahead of your plate wearers for sure. Now let's talk about one of the other contextual features which kind of helps the cause of Feral Druid in particular when we're talking about tanks especially. Feral Leather Boots. They're not extremely close to this in performance but they're kind of close for a crafted blue pre-raid and they're exceptionally helpful given that people should go into Karazhan knowing that these boots, the Edgewalker Long Boots, are one of the most competitive items to obtain from 10 Mans. So in a sort of basic way, the lack of stamina kind of plays in a tiny bit into your Feral Druid. And importantly, perhaps the most important factor, at least in this slot particularly, you're not gonna prioritize rogues or ferals very often. Now in the case of rogues, this is their phase two bis as well. And this is where I think you can throw a small bone to your rogue because they're very rarely going to be prioritized on most items, right? People meme about melee and TBC and stuff. It's not as bad as people say, but you're definitely going to be a little bit more reluctant to give most items that are shared between a rogue and a hunter. Most times you're going to side with the hunter. So this is a good opportunity to just get a nice sort of reward to your rogue that hopefully is trying really hard to be doing well. So it's their phase two bis, and for longevity reasons, I would place it on your rogue first. Following this, as I mentioned with the feral thing, it has the stamina which appeals to the feral tanks, but this also double dips as both the best DPS and tank boot for ferals. So I would place ferals tentatively by a small slither in that second slot, just behind rogues and just ahead of hunters. Now, hunters obviously have the Fiend Slayer boots that I've talked about already. That That's kind of the main reason why they are a tiny bit behind your rogue and druid, at least to my mind. 
Following this, you have your Enhancement. Again, not too far behind, because Enhancements do good damage, they bring essential buffs, you want to keep them happy, and there's a guild management especially, but ultimately, they do have those Fiend Slayer boots, and they are lower DPS than Hunters. So, overall, I'd place it like that, with the Plate Warriors being the very last priority on this item. Again, it's 10-man loot. I can't emphasize this enough. You can craft the groups to sort of min-max Edgewalker Long Boots if that's becoming an issue. But just keep in mind that this is very, very nitpicky on a very specific class context. You could definitely make arguments on completely different contexts, and that would probably supersede class context for this one. With that said though, let's move on quickly because that was a mouthful. So we have Belt of Gale Force next. This is quite a simple one. It's pretty strong. It's quite far behind Primal Mooncloth Belt and Windhawk Belts for both Paladin and Shaman. So you're going to pick the Paladin or Shaman, which is neither tailoring or leatherworking. Hopefully that would be a rarity as far as most guilds go. It's very, very useful to be one or the other as far as a Paladin or Shaman healer is concerned. But... This is very, very good as the next best thing. Now we have Crimson Girdle of the Indomitable, and this is essentially the very best mitigation belt available in Phase 1 for both your plate tanks. Now, again, there, there is some awkwardness in terms of the Paladin itemization early on. They're going to struggle a little bit on both threat and staying alive in terms of it's a juggling act and there's not a lot of stat budget to go around super early on. But at the same time, your prop warrior is probably getting a little bit more uptime as the main tank, for example. So those two things kind of balance out, in my opinion, or mitigate out if you want to be a meme lord. And essentially, I wouldn't put a prior here. And now we're onto Brooch of Unquenchable Fury, which is one of the best neck options available to spellcasters, particularly in a similar way to those gloves we just spoke about on Ataman. Hit is sometimes not as desirable for certain specs, but it, this is one of the sort of efficient slots to gain the hit. There's not particularly amazing necks out there in phase one, so this kind of fits a nice efficient way to gain that tickle of hit, or in the case of something like a fire mage, the deluge of hit that they're going to want. So. By and large, this can go anywhere, and I do mean anywhere. The only one, only spec I would leave out of this one is the Elemental Shaman. It's going to be a common theme as we go through a lot of these caster items. Elemental Shamans are really averse to hit items. They don't need very much hit. They've got so much baked in, more so than even Shadow Priest and Affliction Warlock. And essentially, they're all about the crit in the early game. So with that in mind, you could go anywhere but Elemental in the early weeks and it would be an okay choice. What I would like to bring up though is that there is a good neck, the Brooch of, un oh, sorry, the brooch of Heightened Potential from Shadow Labs and it's very, very close. If you don't lose Hit Cap by switching Unquenchable Fury for Heightened Potential, then the Heightened Potential sometimes simulates better for some specs. Likewise, in terms of your Boomkin particularly, who would probably have some interest in this too, despite having some hit talents and being in the elemental group now, in your 25 mans at least, there is a neck called the Eye of the Night, and essentially it's a min-max neck where you'll gain 34 spell power on use as a party-wide buff. Now, it ends up being one of the better necks just from that buff for yourself, but obviously everyone else won't be using that neck. So they get even more spell power. So you'd be buffing your Elemental Shaman and the three Destro Locks that are in the same group as the Boomkin. And if that's the case, then the Boomkin is out on all the necks. They're not interested. You're going to help them with the cost of all these Eye of the Knights, hopefully, as a guild. And they're not really going to be a big consideration until the next have very little demand because Eye of the Night is super good to min-max if that's your jam. And if it is, the Boomkin is pretty much the best candidate to be abusing it 
and it's not any massive hit to their performance. It's a pretty decent neck regardless. Just a little note. Next up we have Morris's Lucky Pocket Watch. It's a very situational trinket for all tanks. It has a slightly higher value on Feral Druid because of the fact that they can't block or parry. But really it's just quite lackluster overall as a trinket. It's good if you're having some real issues on a dangerous phase, maybe in phase two. Oh, sorry. <laughs> dangerous phase in an encounter in tier five, I should say, maybe progress, etc. But really, it, it's it's not very good. You could go anywhere here. No one should be upset. It's just not that good. Very situational. Next up, we have Signet of Unshakable Faith. This is just not competitive at all. This is, this is a void crystal written all over it. If you've got vanilla geared healers, they probably have better in terms of throughput at least. Maybe not on regen, but on throughput, they have a better one already. So literally, <laughs> don't think about this one. Likewise, this idol. I mean, if your Resta Druid has absolutely no idol of relevance, sure. But really, it's, it's bad. You're going to be using the Shadow Labs idol forever if you're the only Resta Druid. And even if you are the second Resta Druid, you sure as hell aren't using this one. Emerald Ripper is next. Now, I don't want to get roasted on this one because of the fact that uh, when I posted the Rogue Quick Meta Guide, people were very keen to play something other than Swords for Rogue. And I'll be honest, that sure do what you like, but this is going only on your Dagger Rogue or a Hunter. And even then for both, it's not the best option either way. It's... It's pretty medium for both. Hunters want fist weapons now because of adamantite weight stones working on their ranged attacks or applying to their ranged attacks rather I should say. So they want fist weapons to use weight stones on. So they're not particularly interested in this dagger anymore whereas before it would have been a little bit better on hunters. Rogues have better options in Malkazine and Blade of the Unrequited. If you have a dagger rogue, they probably are gonna be quite rare because I assume that rogues are going to want to try and pump as much DPS as possible to remain somewhat relevant, especially in the very early stages. And that's swords, to be honest. It's a rough life. But let's move on. So moving on swiftly, we've got bands of indwelling. Now, these are identical almost to the Sethic Hall's heroic braces. But those two are bis for priest and druid. So you're definitely prioritizing your priests and druids here. But there is another external option in heroics. The reason why you put druid behind priest here is that if they are leather working or if they were desperate for a braces slot and didn't really care about their professions, the windhawk braces are better than this one and, sent, and hence you'd have a lower priority. I did kind of misspoke, just misspeak rather, just now. It's not out and out bis for druids. It is bis if they're not leather working. If they're leather working, windhawk is better than this one, and as such, you should prioritize your priest ever so slightly. Bands of nefarious deeds. These are okay. They're not worth prioritizing anyone because braces of havoc exist and they are crafted blue. It's pretty easy to do. Better output for minimal effort. Likewise, Crimson Braces of Gloom from Heroic Ramparts are better for most casters as well. So with that in mind, don't think too hard on this one. It could easily be a Void Crystal Candidate by week three. Now onto Boots of Foretelling, and these are awesome. These are exceptional in terms of anyone who's looking to not you know, boost up their hit. In particular, and you're gonna see this as a common theme on, on slots where there is a hit versus crit sort of decision. And here you're looking very much at your elemental shamans. Again, these are fantastic for all casters, assuming they can fit them in with their hit situation. The problem being that elemental shamans get to that stage so quickly that you pretty much do wanna put your first pair onto your elemental shaman if he's in the raid for this 10 man, right? It's just 
that extreme of a difference in speeds of which you'll get to a stage where you can reliably use these boots in an optimal setup. So Elemental gets a slight priority here, but quite frankly, it could go anywhere because these boots with or without the crit are pretty good. The crit is a nice bonus. I don't need to tell you too much about what we've discussed with Shadow Priest and Affliction. They are looking more at Shadow Weave boots if they're tailors especially, and your Shadow Based Destruction Warlocks also are probably looking at Frozen Shadow Weave boots as well, though these are not awful by any means. This would leave a priority that looks a bit like Elemental Shaman first and foremost, followed by Fire Warlocks, followed by Fire Mages, Arcane Mages, followed by Boomkin, or even equal with Boomkin. However it works out in terms of the hit situation, but I do want to emphasize Elemental really gets to that stage of wanting these kind of crit items really damn early. So you, you may as well get them on side early when it's not a big deal, if you know what I mean. Braces of Maliciousness. This is essentially the best enhanced bracer outside of Primal Strike from Leatherworking. There are several options that are all pretty close, really close even. There is, there'll probably be a gear set that says, hey, not, you're wrong. These are not the best for enhanced, but they're there or thereabouts. They're really good, whereas they're not that close to the top option for pretty much every other spec. So enhance first and foremost, followed by whoever else is looking for something like this. Now we're on to Mitts of the Tree Mender. This is quite a clear Druid Prio. It's their best in slot for throughput. It also has Spirit, so Rest of Shaman's Holy Paladins, they're not that interested in that Spirit element and that reduces the appeal to them a little bit. But these are fantastic gloves, even if you ignored the Spirit. Shamans and Paladins though, do have better options. We saw from Ataman right away that Paladins have a 62 healing MP5 glove that is plate with double socket as well. That's kind of their preference there. Shamans also have gloves literally coming up the next, the very next item. So this is a Druid item through and through. This is your default Resto Shaman uh, glove. Again, Paladins would be very, would love these too, though the Atman gloves are literally a tiny bit better. So you're gonna prioritize your Shamans here, but these are by no means bad on your Paladin. The Paladin could wear either these or the Atman gloves and they'd be almost identical in performance. But rest of shamans obviously have less less options. Go with your rest of shaman first. Next we have gloves of quickening. These are not very good. They are worse than a green from a netherstorm quest for enhance warriors and rets. Whilst hunters are just not interested in these either. Void crystal is probably worth a void crystal rather is probably worth more to the guild week one than these are to whoever's attempting to get them. Literally. They are worse than some greens. Braces of Justice are of course a Holy Paladin item. They're pretty decent, though they're not the best option. That would be reserved for Windhawk Braces, unless I have forgotten something. Next we have Iron Gauntlets of the Maiden. The best mitigation gloves for Prot Warrior and, pa and Paladin, but both are probably going to use Tier 4 for general use. Once again, it's worth noting that Paladins do have a more difficult time early on, but I'm not sure that's enough to warrant a genuine priority here. Without the sort of strength on it, it does mean that you get a tiny bit more stat budget for your money by giving it to the prop Paladin, but that's really splitting hairs. Next, we have Barb Choker of Discipline. This is essentially, again, the best neck in the game for your prop paladins and prop warriors in phase one. It's not very close, at least as far as defensive necks go. So these get a prio over Feral Druid by quite a large degree. A Feral Druid could use this, but is more interested in the, the agility options like, such as Necklace of the Juggernaut from Badges if they're in the market for a defensive necklace. Next up we have Totem of Healing Reigns. And whilst early, early on, shamans are not going to be as happy to cast Chain Hill right away. It has a bit of scaling to do a tiny bit at the start. This is 
you know, that's the totem, right? Within quite soon, once they get to a good gear level, like end of phase one, middle of phase two, it, it, it's 95% or maybe 90%, but pretty much all chain hill spam. So this is really a, a great item, obviously, and only for resto shamans. Now, Shine of Virtuous is an interesting one. It kind of brings me to a more, I guess I would say, philosophical point as far as guild management and loot distribution goes, right? Light's Justice from Prince Malkazar is flat out best in slot for all healers in phase one. It's not, not close, like, it's just, that's facts. And there's no problem with giving a Light's Justice to a Shaman or a Paladin, for example. But because Spirit exists on it, and looking forwards to Phase 2, you're probably going to want to give the Light Fathom Scepter from Lady Vash to your Shamans and Paladins first. This is a very good item with that context in mind, right? You've got the slight Spirit thing going on with the Priests and Druids, and you're looking forward to Lady Vash, and you can see that whilst it is again Misrule Healers, the Lady Vash weapon in Phase 2, it does suit paladins and shamans a little bit more. So this is a nice compromise to my mind. It's not too far behind the Light's Justice, but obviously not quite as good. So to my mind, I would put this on shamans and paladins first, ahead of druids and priests, with the idea that you're going to put the Prince Light's Justice Mace onto your priests and druids. And then later on, obviously probably months in advance, where everyone might have a Light's Justice anyway, but just in case they don't, you're probably looking to put the Light Fathom Scepters from Lady Vash onto your Paladins and Shamans first. So that's where I would stand on it. You could do anything here, honestly. Like you could go by Biggest Pumper on HPS, you could go by the most reliable person. Class Prior is kind of awkward here, but I think, I think it was it's worth stating that kind of healer weapon sort of trajectory. All right, so I lean towards Shaman's Palace here just because of that forward thinkingness, but you could easily go with just anyone on any of the healer weapons because, quite frankly, this is 10 man loot and everyone eventually, hopefully, will get one before we're into phase two. But just in case they're not, if there's not enough lights justice to go around, I would put this on Paladins and Shamans first. All right, so this is opera now and there's a lot of items here so i'm going to try and blast through them without wasting too much of your time trial fire trousers are good they're worse than spell strike spell strike are boe and these are a lot worse if that person is tailoring to benefit from the tailoring two-piece bonus with spell strike hood and spell strike legs as such you're going to want to prior these to non-tailors for sure but also probably to non-tailors that also happen to be super broke. These are great legs, don't get me wrong, but if you're trying to blast, they're not not, not in the same ballpark as Spell Strike. Earth Soul, these are great legs for all healers that can use them, but there is a male option called Heart Flame Leggings that we're going to get to for Shamans and Paladins, which are slightly better. As such, Druid Prior. There's only one set of legs that are better than these four druids for throughput and those are the world boss legs that for many guilds are going to be you know not on the menu beast more pauldrons for context these are worse than tier 3 hunter shoulders put them anywhere where they're an upgrade and don't spend your limited time discussing these essentially Eternian great helm is solid for both prop paladins and warriors but not the best for either prop paladins get the smallest upgrade from this so if both prop tanks need it i'd pro the warrior here but it's really not an important decision either way ribbon of sacrifice is decent it's pretty much a stat stick with an upside for direct healers so druids are very much bottom here they probably shouldn't be using this over something like the lower city prayer book or even my favorite trinket to shill over, the Scarab of Infinite Cycles, this is not for your Druids. This is mostly going to be best on your Paladin because they're going to be blasting the tanks with direct chunky heals. So the Fecundity stuff works out pretty well there. 
Either way though, it can go on any healer. It's decent. If you've got Eye of the Dead, for example, it's not as good. So, good item. Holy Pans get slightly better from it, but it could go on Holy Paler, Rest of Shaman, Holy Priest. Doesn't really matter. Just don't give this to your Rest of Druid, to be honest. They should want other items. Libra of Souls Redeemed. This is obviously going to go towards your Holy Paladin. Looking now at the Crone, you've got the Wicked Witch's Hat. And essentially this is a Void Crystal. Ruby Slippers are pretty good. Now these are essentially the boots that I was talking about in, in terms of the Karazhan boots. That sort of dovetail with the Crit boots we saw on Maiden. And they've got hit on them, obviously. They also have a nice Hearthstone aspect to them too which is quite convenient once nobody else actually needs them for actually doing stuff for damaging sorry i should say so ultimately this is going to go towards your hit light specs the ones that really want hit so fire mages are probably interested in these very early because their hit situation is pretty dire unless you're running two elemental shamans but essentially these can go anywhere Again, the context of what they currently have already is probably more important than class on this one. Next up, we have Legacy. It's not great for any of the possible candidates, but the best mileage, I guess, is going to be going onto your green geared Hunter. Now, importantly, as mentioned, Hunters want fist weapons. Trust me on this one. Since they found the Whitestone thing, it's a pretty massive gap now. You, you can't really get away <laughs> without using the Weightstone stuff. So it's pretty bad, man. This this is, a void. unfortunately, even though it looks cool, it's going to be a Void Crystal pretty early on. Blue Diamond Witch Wand. This is pretty much the only Phase 1 Healer Wand. So it goes on to your Holy Priest. Next up, we have Masquerade Gown. And this one is just not very good essentially this is a void crystal waiting to happen but you could put it on someone who's green geared or just you know really far behind whatever it is romulo's poison vial now this trinket is not great at all but it's okay and in particular it's okay on a rogue it's not dst by any stretch of the imagination it's not bloodless brooch by any stretch of the imagination but it's decent so if your rogue's needing the trinket slot it definitely goes to your rogue. Other specs, from what I understand, really struggled to get value from this. And it's just not a big deal. But if someone else wants this, I guess. Now, Blade of the Unrequited is really interesting. Going into TBC, this was seen as potentially the best hunter weapon. Because it has the three sockets, you can stack Agi in it. Also, in terms of survival hunter you're going to stack Agi onto these sockets and you benefit from the exposed weakness. Now, in terms of Beast Mastery, you're going double fist. It's, there's an eye of, uh, Claw of the Watcher from Heroic something. has two sockets, a fist weapon, you can put a weight stone on it. And then there's a blue offhand, which they will use in terms of a weight stone again. I think it's called Storm Reaver Claw. In terms of survival though, because of exposed weakness, Technically, this is a little bit better than the second best fist. So there we use one fist for one weight stone and use this and uh, a wizard oil, I believe, or whatever the MP5 oil is called, is going to go on to here. And essentially, this is a small raid bonus over going double fists for themselves. So realistically, put this on your survival hunter. Or if you do have one, this is the best offhand for dagger rogues. I would be surprised if you have a dagger rogue once they see the damage compared to swords. Despair is pretty bad. It is a bit too fast to be good. It looks awesome, like it is. It looks pretty good. But ultimately, it's just a bit middling. It's okay on your arms warrior if they're not a swordsmith. Again, a bit fast. Not completely awful though. Does a job until they can be they can get better. Part of me feels like Whilst there's no sim tool, keep in mind for arms, part of me feels like an axe might be better, like despair is not good enough, even though sword spec is the best specialization 
four arms. Part of me feels like this bear would come, you know, below something like Gorehow in performance, but it remains to be seen until we get a sim tool. Now, Red Riding, Red Riding Hood's cloak is pretty good. It pretty much follows the exact same formula as the Prince cloak, and the Prince cloak is the best cloak for phase one for healers. There's no real prio here. All the best cloaks have the exact same kind of profile. There's no real edges either way. So this can go anywhere. If they get this cloak, they're probably not getting the first Prince cloak, for example, in terms of just, you know, moving loot around efficiently. Big Bad Wolf's Head. This is literally the biggest Void Crystal, I think, in the entire instance. Big Bad Wolf's Paw. Now this one's interesting. It's a bit fast for your Enhances and potentially even your Fury Warrior, but you may have heard down the grapevine that the enhanced weapon situation is a little bit awkward. So th there is some scope to get some value out of this with an enhanced shaman. It, it will definitely go to your enhance over a fury warrior if both want it. It is, as I mentioned, a bit fast, but it's not completely trash. That said, though, this is going to have minimal demand outside of that first few weeks because even though the, the weapon situation is kind of awful for Enhance, they can definitely get a better main hand than this. Next up we have Wolf Slayer Sniper Rifle. This is, to the best of my knowledge, the second best weapon for Hunters. Though the weapon speed thing has fluctuated a little bit since I last looked, I believe. But I do think this is the second best Wolf Slayer, the second best ranged weapon, sorry, for Hunters. Now, importantly, Alliance side you have the Dwarf Racial which means that they're going to get a little bit more value from using the Wolf Slayer Sniper Rifle for a little bit longer. Say for example you get blessed with a Week 1 Wolf Slayer and you have a Dwarf and a Draenei in the group that are both Hunters. You're, you're probably going to put this on the Dwarf. They might be a little bit upset that they're not going to get Sun Fury right away. Like the first Sun Fury is not going to go to the Dwarf until unless they're the only Hunter you know after that that needs it but it's, it's pretty good it's, it's not too far away when you factor in the gun ratio though sun fury is better obviously this can be used as a stat stick too again both warriors rogues have a green that's pretty close to this they have a crafted blue which is not too far away from this so really do not give this to your melee as a stat stick until you're really scraping the barrel right like this is 100% going to a hunter even if they're a little bit disappointed that this might impact their Sun Fury odds very soon, you know, in the near future. It, it just has to go to a hunter. This brings us to Pauldrons of the Solace Giver. These are solid enough, but Priests have better options in both Tier 4 and Primal Mooncloth. Other healers have even more options, so you would prior prioritise the Holy Priest, but typically it's an unimportant decision. This is not the best option for priests, or any other healer for that matter. Speaking of better options, druids do have access, as well as you know, paladins, shamans, to forest wind shoulder pads, and they're decent, they're not fantastic. Nobody's really going to care about this item in the grand picture, in the big picture, but you're going to prioritize druids slightly, if all three were to need it, for example, just because of that spirit factor. They're getting some value from the spirit, Pal and the Shamans just aren't. Dragon Quake shoulder guards are pretty much the same thing as Forest Wind, just flipped into the Paladin Shaman sort of area. It's not the best option, it's not going to be super competitive with the top options, it's just there if somebody needs it. Obviously, it doesn't matter, like, even though Paladins probably have more options because of the whole plate thing, it, this could go anywhere. No one's going to be upset. Next up we have Rin Dynasty Greaves. Now, these are very important in terms of just getting them onto both your prop tanks are going to be fantastic, both for prop warrior and prop paladin. These are the best defensive legs for phase one, typically in the case of Prot Warrior, they're going to build the four piece around their Rin Dynasty Greaves, so they'll use four out of five tier four, to the best of my knowledge, alongside these Greaves. 
because they're just really efficient, it doesn't help that the tier 4 legs have no sockets. Similarly, prop paddling are probably going or prop paddlings I should say are going to do the same thing pretty much with their tier 4. They'll probably run four pieces for general use with these as the legs to keep them chunky. In terms of a priority though, honestly, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Again, it, for most of these prop warrior prop paladin items, you could flip a coin and just use other factors. Like class has no real bearing on a lot of these items for those two. Corona Signet Ring is a very contested item, one of the best rings for agility users, but hit is very abundant across gear in Phase 1 in particular. As such, if you're running a Boomkin, this is a rare case of rogues having a priority on an item. Yep, don't call the cops, there is indeed another rogue prior item. And this is essentially because they need 28 or 25% if you're running a Boomkin, percent hit to you know to cap out and their very their, their value of hit is still really quite high all the way up to that hard cap if you have no boomy though hunters do get prior so it's a caveated prior rogue has got a little bit of glimmer there but if you don't have a boomkin in your 25 man raid which is a little bit sad hunters are going to want this because they'll need it to make up that three percent hit which they've lost from not having a boomkin apply improved improved fairy fire to the boss. I guess you could use a Resta Druid to do the same thing, though that would be a, a bit boring. But e either way, you know, if you have no improved fairy fire, this goes to your hunters first. If you don't, this will go to your rogues first. Following this, you're looking at the melee orientated specs that are not rogues and Whilst this is a great ring for those specs like Enhance, Feral, even Ret, Shapeshifter's Signet is better. For Warriors too, like, it, it's a good ring, but the expertise from Shapeshifters, which is Lower City Exalted, pushes it ahead. It's really good. It's just that Rogue's value hit so highly that they're willing to take this over Shapeshifters most of the time. Now, Staff of Infinite Mysteries, I think I uh, wrote, rewrote my notes a couple times for this one. Um, it's a really awkward one, super, super awkward. It's a decent weapon, but much like vanilla, you've got one-handers with an offhand typically being the best performance. You'll notice again, it's got a big chunk of hit on it and reasonable spell power. So the truth is on this one, Self-interested raiders will not want this because they know it means a delay to Nathrazim Mind Blade or Blood More Magus Blade if they're a sword user. All in all, it's a really awkward item to place on anyone. For DPS min-maxing, and let me emphasize again, this is being very nitpicky, you'd A, focus this towards a hit-like hit -like spec like Destro Warlock or Fire Mage, but also B to the players that generate the least DPS to be honest and that would lean towards your lowest performer out of the mages or rather out of your fire mages if you have several. If you have several Destrolocks in the 10 man group or two rather I should say probably not running three in 10 man you're going to put it on the lower performer again I'm not sure you should hold it against them and what I mean by that is if you put it on somebody whilst it probably does delay them from the first mind blade or blood more magus blade whatever it is that drops first you, you, it's just not quite good enough to really use it against people so hopefully you're going to min max your 10 man groups moving forward whoever got this staff put them in a group that gives them a good chance of getting mind blade later on because like i said it's a really awkward one it's not a bad item it's one of those ones where nobody wants to get stuck with the parcel. It's like pass the parcel, but negative, right? You just you, you just don't want it really if you're being self-interested. But from a guild perspective, you want to put it on the lower performers, on specs that have more struggles with hit, and that is looking at your mages, or fire mages, I should say, and your Destral Warlocks that are underperforming or doing less performance than others. You can also bring you know something like a Boomkin, 
or a Shadow Priest into the mix, whilst both Boomkin and Shadow Priest aren't too difficult, aren't in too difficult a spot for spell hit. They are obviously the lower end of the spectrum on damage. So you could easily dunk this on either of those specs too, and it would probably be a decent choice. Again, I'm not entirely sure. If your Boomkin and the Shadow Priest are, you know, getting their pre-raid bis, because of the gavel of Unearthed Secrets, I'm not sure whether they'd even take this, to be honest. But if they do want it or will take it, they are a good candidate as well because they're lower damage. Again, though, remember this is 10-man content. It's an awkward one to place. I probably wouldn't use Class Pro here. And if you do give it to somebody uh, early on, if you get an early drop of this, try to be kind in regards to fixing groups for them in future. That gives them a little shot at the Mind Blade because it, this is one of those weird items that nobody wants to be left with, but somebody has to take it. A bit like um, those BWL staffs, right? Uh, not the good one, not the Shadow Flame one, the other one, the one that's a corn, the corn staff. It's a, it was an okay item as soon as Phase 3 released, but nobody really wanted it. This is kind of that item, just souped up TBC version, with a cooler graphic in my opinion. So now we're on to our first tier tokens. And this 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 gets a little bit um, tricky at times for these tier tokens across you know all the tier tokens we're going to look at. Fortunately, some are really clear cut, others not so much. So with that said, let's get stuck into the Fallen Champion. And fortunately for this token, it's not incredibly competitive. Tier 4 gloves are best for prop paladins, for general use, for pure mitigation, it's not, but for threat plus some mitigation, they are the best, so general use, they are good. And in some sets, and I'm going to really emphasize the some sets aspect because a lot of theory crafters are telling me whilst the sims say the gloves are not a bad choice to get your two piece as an enhance that you should be going for chest and shoulders with that said both enhanced shaman and rets will likely forego the grips uh, forego these sorry for grips of deafness and those are the expertise gloves from trash that we've talked about very briefly or potentially the martial perfection gloves in the case of retribution Rogues are going to use Wastewalker Gloves to grab the two-piece bonus as part of their Phase 1 BIS. So again, they're not in the market. Likewise, Resto and Elemental Shamans have better options, as do Holy Paladins. So it really comes down to Prop Paladin, followed by Enhancement, if they are willing to forego Grips of Deafness, which I'm not sure they would want to, but if they do, feel free. And then kind of a free-for-all for whoever hasn't been lucky or who just wants them for collection. It's pretty much prop paladin, then maybe you're an enhancement shaman, followed by the rest of the specs. Not too competitive. In terms of the Fallen Defender, there's going to be a similar theme across all Fallen Defender tokens across Phase 1. And this is probably one of the very few areas you give a strong priority to your Feral Druid on a competitive item. Tier 4 is just so strong for Feral that you'll typically have the strongest balanced gear setups featuring all 5 tier 4 pieces. Since all slots are exceptionally large upgrades from pre-raid options and the gloves are no different. Following this, Prot Warriors use tier 4 gloves as part of their phase 1 BIS setup according to at least what's available at the moment. But it's not especially big, they're more interested in the bonus rather than actually the gloves stats so that's why you would push them a little bit below feral druids in that case the remaining specs all have better options for phase one so feral has a strong strong priority followed by pro warriors which is not a super strong priority more of a soft prio and then everyone else whoever wants to you know get a filler item or collection etc fortunately this one is, the Fallen Hero one is super straightforward. Hunter, Mage, Warlock, give this to whoever, because none of them want it. Literally none of them. Like, if you're, if, if they're thinking about min-maxing and stuff like that, this really would, it, it, it doesn't work. This is, <laughs> they don't need these. So, essentially, this is your non-tailors are going to pop up. Like, the, the Mage that doesn't have tailoring are going to pop up. The Fire Warlock that hasn't gone uh, Spellfire might pop up here but even so 
they're more interested more, more interested in the flowing thought gloves that we've already covered they and hunters just don't use tier four at all so this is a, a dead token essentially all right so now we're on to your boy illy and the gilded thurian cloak is it's okay defensively for both prop warrior and prop paladin but where it's really shining and where it really has a massive impact in terms of longevity and defense it's your feral druid again it's not a very competitive item so it doesn't really follow that theme i was talking about with the fallen defender tokens the prop the other prop tanks are just not that interested in this it's useful but not fantastic they would rather use devil shark cloak from steam vaults so in this sense this is a slam dunk on your feral druid they're going to use it for an awfully long time shadow vine cloak of infusion this is just a mistake like this this shouldn't have been made this way like where are the stats are I actually don't understand this one at all. So, pretty much a Void Crystal. Cincture of Will. Now, this one, not super competitive, simply due to the least amount of options and benefiting from Spirit. Priests would get a slight nod here, followed by Druids, then the other two healers. But nobody's really going to bat an eyelid on this one. It gets dunked by both the Primal Mooncloth Belt and the Windhawk Belt, which usually not always your healers probably have access to one or both but like not one or both one or the other of these malefic girdle it's okay but due to no sockets this is outclassed by around five to eight belts depending on which specs we're talking about there's an almost identical belt as part of the karazan attunement in adal's gift minus the stamina and three spell damage so too long didn't read version is go with whoever this item does not warrant any in-depth consideration. Call of Nature's Sustenance. Same as Cincture. Priests can't equip it, but it's pretty decent for Druids, but it's just not the best option. So make of that what you will. Not a big deal. Either way, Druids like prior because of Spirit, but not too bad anywhere else. Just not the best. Girdle of the Prowler is very similar, just for a different set of specs. It's not a very competitive item. It's decent on Hunters. Not much else to say on this one. There are several better options for most specs. Breastplate of the Lightbinder is, of course, a Holy Paladin item. More of a stopgap temporary item, because there are several better options. All of the exclusive profession chests are better, as well as tier 4. So, it's not an important decision. If you were running two Holy Paladins, I don't think either of them would mind who gets this. Mender's Heart Ring. This is an okay ring. Obviously, the spirit skews it slightly to Druids and Priests, but it doesn't hold up on a throughput aspect. There are several better options it doesn't matter where this goes. This is more of a where is it the biggest upgrade kind of item because of the fact that it's just not quite competitive with the top rings for this phase. The Lightning Capacitor, this is where you have one correct choice and then no other correct choices. This is an elemental shaman trinket just flat out. I'm not even sure any other specs get any real value from this. I'm sure they could get a little bit, but it really does calm down to this is an elemental shaman trinket. It's pretty much the only reason. It's huge for them, but it's it's the only real candidate for this trinket. No one else really wants it. Fool's Bane is a pretty good weapon here. I would personally go for a non-blacksmith enhancement shaman. Just because of their more limited options. They can't use swords, for example. And it is rough out there, I'll be honest. And this is a little bit wrong. I'm on a 2.4.3 client at the moment because I already had Atlas loot set up. This is a main hand only weapon now, as of recent on the beta. They changed them all back to main hand. So this is only main hand. It competes with the blacksmithing weapons. It competes with Decapitator in that main hand slot. It's worse than Decapitator. This would go on your non orc enhancement shamans or warriors. Your orcs are going to have a slight prior on Decapitator, though Decapitator is better than this, point blank for all. A 
quick note outside of those two specs rogues can use this if they're really unlucky you still need to run a sword in the offhand but they can reasonably use maces in the main hand whilst they find a better option particularly human rogues now this is everyone's favorite hentai stave this is actually the very best feral druid staff it has a, a balanced setup a more defensive setup would use the Sonaran Exalted uh, Mace, but this is, once you have everything sorted, this is pretty much the best weapon for Phase 1 for Feral Druids, and will last reasonably well into Phase 2, until Season 2's Arena Weapon, I believe, on terms of threat. For defense, there is a better option in Phase 2, but by and large, this is going to get quite a lot of longevity, and there's only real one candidate for it. Alternatively, before you disenchant it, once the ferals have it, of course, there is a, a reason to give this to a moonkin instead of making it into a void crystal. Essentially, if there were fights where you know boomkins are struggling on mana, I, I, I'm not sure how it's going to play out. Obviously, with all the tuning, we've only tested the really easy stuff so far, the phase one stuff. But if you bonk some, you might not be aware, but if you bonk something with a feral attack power item. In Moonkin form, it acts a little bit like Judgment of Wisdom. You're getting some mana back for bonking. I, I can't say why it works that way. I think there was a lot of upset it got from Vanilla that went into TBC regarding mana with Moonkins. So, worst case scenario, you know, your, your Moonkin runs out of mana, equips this, starts bashing something to get some mana back so they can get back to doing real damage. But it's a niche case, but I would actually do it over disenchanting it early on. Zabian Stiletto. Now, it's not a great item, does a job, it's, it's okay for rogues and warriors, but notably has a similar value to a green called Mama's Insurance from Netherstorm and the crafted Fell Steel Whisper Knives. So, really don't waste time on this one. Assign it to somebody and forget about it. Don't even think of it really as a real item, to be honest. Like, it's one of those ones where you give it to somebody, they might get some benefit from it but you pretend they still haven't got an item because it's so small. That kind of item. Now we're into Shade of Aran, and Drape of the Dark Reavers is, again, I actually originally said there are very few rogue items, but in this one actually is a rogue item, like clear cut, there's no even debate on this one, is exponentially better on a rogue than any other candidate. So this one is strong rogue prior, like this isn't even close. All other physical DPSs typically want Vengeance Wrap over this. It does have, it's a pretty good cloak regardless, like it is good, but it's more suited to you know rogues as a hard prior, followed by feral, followed by the rest. And the reason why it's pretty good on feral is that it's pretty good for DPS, but also very nice with the stamina and a little bit of hit and stuff and agility for threat sets for your feral tank though the cloak slot is so efficient with the one we just saw the gilded throwing cloak that's so efficient at making you tanky as a feral druid that this this might not sneak in even if you gave it to a feral druid and they wanted to pump threat so either way it's pretty much a rogue item though it has uses everywhere else it's, it's just not as good as vengeance wrap that's the tldr Mantle of the Mind Flayer, this is worse than several Dungeon Blues, including the Cypher of Damnation quest reward, Spoulders of the Torn Heart, which a lot of players are going to be doing, you know, in the first week of TBC. So this one, literally Void Crystal territory. Boots of the Infernal Coven, fairly weak, best on a Boomy or Shadow Priest, if anything, but probably a Void Crystal. Boots of the Incorrupt. Now, these are slightly worse than Slippers of Serenity from Orkanai Crypts for context. So they're not a highly competitive item. You would prior these to Priests just because of less options, followed by Druids because of the Spirit thing, and then the rest. It's not a very important item. No one's going to get upset over this one. Rapscallion Boots are just kind of awkward. They've got a lot of stat budget into that slightly higher stamina value. It's worse than a lot of dungeon items. And it probably, 
will be better off disenchanted early on unless there's a candidate with really low gear like really poor gear maybe they've been a they've boosted a character and they still have all those ugly ass greens or greens everywhere but even so there are some greens that are very close to the value of this so not a big one either way steel spine face guard it's a void crystal i wouldn't even give this to a green gear tune i'd be surprised if they didn't have better because a Zangamash quest reward is better DPS, as some context. Next up, Pauldrons of the Justice Seeker are obviously a Holy Paladin item. It's pretty much what they will use to hold them over until they get tier 4. Though, there are, perhaps for throughput specifically, slightly better options that you could get in Karazhan. But th this is pretty much the quintessential pre-tier 4 shoulders shoulder for holy paladin next we've got saber claw talisman this is a very nice neck for a balanced feral druid set for tanking i'm not sure there's too many other use cases i haven't seen that pop up too much in discussions for any other spec in terms of the you know uh points value the ep points value it is not fantastic for anyone barring feral druid essentially so again a Feral Druid item might not make the cut depending on what they already have, but at the end of phase one, if they've got all sort of reasonably, you know, available items, ex except for the highly, highly competitive items, this probably will make the cut. It's a good balance neck. Sherman Art Great Ring. This is where most rings for tanks from raids in phase one particularly follow this formula. And this formula doesn't really lend itself particularly well to prop tanks like for prop warriors and prop paladins there are more interesting things like block rating you know getting a lot more mitigation on their rings rather than just having stamina defense armor it's not bad for them not by any stretch but it's it, it's just an awkward one it does it's not itemized particularly well for them for this reason there are better options from heroics as elementium band of the century it's far and away better than this for defensive purposes for both prop warrior and prop paladin whilst your feral druid is going to get the most gain from this because the armor in particular and of course they can't block or parry so they're all in on defense stamina armor and agility slash dodge you know so this has more value on the feral druid though it doesn't make the cut it's not their bis ring so with that information you could go anywhere but the most value is the feral druid now this thing this pendant um it is probably a void crystal not gonna lie it's probably a void crystal but but part of me really wants somebody to break this in terms of like arcane mage obviously it has no spell damage but obviously the regen aspects maybe i don't know like but this is probably a void crystal I, i'm i'm talking rubbish at this point but part of me really wants to see an arcane mage do something crazy with this around soothing sapphire it's pretty good it's generally just a strong item and uh, it's more of an item that saves you from going for tears of heaven first as a healer particularly for the you know non-shielders the non-shield boys you know you've got priest druid they they're going to be using an offhand assuming they have a decent one hand and in that sense this is a good option until they have the badge offhand but it's not especially important. The badge offhand is the best option by quite some margin, especially when we're considering throughput. So realistically, this could go to anyone, but probably you're going to lean towards obviously druids, priests, because they don't have access to shields. And there is a nice shield later on with Magtheridon. Now, Tyrus Full Wand of Ascendancy, this is a, a really tricky one, and I kind of hated writing this one up because it they, they felt like there was no easy way to explain this one and it definitely feels like not really a class priority item i'll put it out there straight away it's very competitive put it that way even for the specs that aren't super keen on hit of the ones that can use it so for example arcane mage even isn't that keen on hit has a bunch of hit in its talent tree for its arcane spells and it's only using arcane spells so it doesn't need a lot of hit, but this is pretty much one of the most efficient places to gain your hit for even those specs. 
So not only do the extremely hit light specs, like Fire Mage, Fire Warlock, etc., what they don't they, they also really want this one usually. And then you've also got these specs that are pretty good on hit that also kind of really want this wand just because it's efficient. There are ones that are competitive with this though. They just have crit on. You have the Black Stalk from the Underborg Heroic and you have the Magtherodon wand. If you happen to be running an Arcane Mage in Phase 1, this is probably the only candidate where I would you know, give them a lesser priority. I know I've just mentioned them in terms of they also have some interest in this. Because of just how good their hit situation is, I probably would put them lower down. But overall, it can go anywhere. It's it is a tough one. I, I essentially it's so close. I wouldn't want to put it out there that there's a class pro. Put it that way. This brings us to the Unimend headdress, and this quite this isn't quite an instant void crystal, but it isn't much better. Evoker's helmet of second sight again from the Terran Gorfine chain is slightly better. And you should probably expect series main characters to have done that chain if not already picked up or planning on picking up the spell strike hood. So this is a pretty quick void crystal candidate, but it has some value in those super early days. It has some value there, but very quickly there is no, no value to be had. Next up, we have Pantaloons of Repentance, and these are exceptional, but healers are very spoiled in this slot, essentially. Priests have the least options, so you'd prioritize them here, followed by Druids, also the spirit thing, right? However, these are good for Shamans and Paladins too, it's just that they have even more options that are slightly more powerful, or very, very similar. Next up, we have Cowl of Defiance, this is a decent item, but not fantastic for anyone. Following the general theme of helms without meta sockets, but if you're really into nitpicking, enhancement can suffice without a meta gem slot better than others, and this ranks decently for their helm options. So don't think too hard on this one, but if there are a couple people that want it and an enhancement is among them, the best value is there as far as class goes. Now, now we're on to Skulker's Greaves, and oof, yeah, I don't know about this one. This this is probably the most competitive item in in Karazhan from the physical DPS side. Um, if world bosses are not on the menu, and for many guilds they won't be, this is the very best pair of legs for pretty much everyone that deals physical damage. Beast Lord Leggings are the worst dungeon set piece by a large margin for Hunters. And essentially, these or the War Boss Legs are your Phase 2 Biss as a Hunter too. So you're going to want to put these on your Hunters first. As much as it you know, pains me to play into the stereotype of you know Hunters go boom, give them all the loot. This kind of is that situation. They, they are obviously exceptional DPSs and... It pretty much, unless you're doing world bosses, is phase 2 bis as well. So with this in mind, you're going to follow the damage on this one. Hunters first. Following Hunters, it's very close between Rogues and Enhancements. I would personally go for Enhancement Shaman just because we've already covered a couple items where Rogues have a priority on a pretty good item. So for me, Enhancements would get a slight edge because it's just it just makes more sense from a spreading the loot perspective you don't want to have the rogue leave with all the best loot to go and be the rogue for somebody else right you want to spread it around and you know sort of mitigate your risk as well as a guild man uh, as sort of like guild leadership but besides that it's very close like for me this is more of a um contextual pick based on what what rogues get other than skulkers but either way it would work out just fine. Important to note, these are very close, if not BIS. They're close to BIS, if not BIS, for Phase 2 for both those specs as well. So don't discriminate too much between them. I would lean Enhancement though, just because of how everything else falls. All the other chips fall, as whatever they say. So Warriors are also likely to be interested in these, 
as potentially our rep paladins. I'm not 100% sure because of a lack of sim tool whether they're going to go skulkers or tier 4 for the set bonus. But by and large, rep paladins might be interesting too. I would put warriors ahead of rep paladins purely because of the fact that rep paladins can get good value from their tier 4 legs. And that is a rarity. We'll come to see it later on. But there's very few specs that want the tier 4 legs. So for just the means again of min-maxing longevity and spreading loot, you put rep paladins behind the warriors here. Now, ferals are also interested in these. These are good for feral threat sets and also for the, the very best option for pure feral DPS. Now, the interesting part here is that it's hard to place because A, pure feral DPS is going to be quite rare. That's quite a snowflake kind of spec. No shade intended. It's, it's going to be fine. It's not a bad spec, but, one, but ferals that don't tank and only DPS is going to be quite rare. So that's one thing that sort of muddies the waters here. On top of that, ferals, you know, it depends on how much active time they're going to be. Are they your main tank? Are they your off tank? If they're your off tank, then, you know, these have more value because they'll spend more time in cat for a number of fights. So by and large, it, it, it's an awkward one. I don't know exactly where I would place ferals. I'd probably put them ahead of rep paladins in a similar sort of space as the warriors, to be honest with you. I would not push them as high as the enhancements or rogues, for example, just because there's a, a lack of certainty. Also, another thing against ferals is that they also can use tier four legs pretty effectively. For feral DPS, it's, it's not the best. For feral tank, it definitely is the best balanced option. So with that context in mind, yeah, I'd, I'd put ferals towards the bottom, maybe slightly ahead of Rep Paladin, but we're really nitpicking here. By and large, to summarize, Hunters followed my Enhancement Shaman and Rogue, slightly favoring the Enhancement if you follow my logic, like if you if you think my logic is, is you know sound on that one, followed by your Warriors, followed by Feral, followed by Rep Paladin. But again, it's exceptionally close. Really, really, it's close. Don't don't get too too aggressive here. I understand how good these are and how competitive they are. You may feel strongly about certain things here. I would use other contexts to help a lot. Class Prio is not a good lens, like in terms of this item specifically. The only thing I would say is that hunters go boom. So probably lean towards hunters. Earth Blood Chest Guard, this is very far behind the best options for Shamans and Holy Paladins, but rest of Shamans get a slight nod just because of the amount of available options uh, there are for Holy Paladin with the two armor proficiencies aspect. Rip Flare Leggings, these are a disenchant candidate to be honest. They are worse than two quest items for those that would use it. It's pretty much a void crystal or dunked on a completely fresh 70 that did not do the important quests whilst they leveled. It is, you know, that kind of situation. Next we have Mantle of Abramis. I hope that's correct. Outside of tier 4, these are pretty nice for both prop warriors and prop paladins. Due to how each gain threat though, you would definitely give warriors an edge here because the righteous pauldrons, whilst they are inferior defensively, offer quite a bit in terms of threat over these because strength is eh, pretty bad for you know prop paladin threat. So by and large, lean towards your warriors first here. Your warriors here first, I should say, sorry. But prop paladins can use this too, so keep that in mind. It's not a disenchant candidate once the warrior has them. Prop paladins can find some use for this in terms of defensive sets. Girdle of Truth is quite clearly a slam dunk for a holy paladin. It's pretty good. That's about it. Shifting Chain of the Afterworld. It's Priest and Druid Prio here, though this neck is quite for heart. Quite far behind the Grawl neck for spirit users and the Nightbane neck for Shaman and Paladins. 
Mithril Band of the Unscarred. It's pretty good for both Arms and Fury. Worse than quest items and dungeon blues for other classes. So I would hard pro this to your Warriors and Rep Paladins. Jewel of Infinite Possibilities is a pretty interesting item if they're not hit capped as a caster. But it's very far behind the raw power of the badge offhands. You'll notice that the badge vendor has not only Cadgar's knapsack, which is just flat spell power and nothing else for all schools. There's also specialized school uh, offhands, a little bit like the AV offhands in vanilla. And in that sense, they have a lot of power pushed into that offhand that casters generally are trying to mold their gear set to abuse those very powerful linear spell damage offhands. So this is good whilst somebody is spell hit starved, but once you get towards like, you know, the later weeks, mid weeks where everyone's getting their gear sorted properly, this drops off a cliff in how good it is, just because it doesn't fit too well with the BIS configurations. So early on, just go with whoever's desperate for hits really, really badly. That's probably your fire mage or a fire warlock. But in, in essence, this does not have too much long-term potential. This is a very short-term item. Spike Blade, um, an interesting difference between TBC and vanilla is just how non-competitive melee weapons are. There's less melee in raids. There's also more weapon drops. And there's also you know, more niches in terms of how they're itemized and what kind of weapon they are, stuff like that. So here, rogues are the only real candidate, and this is because there's not many swords available. There's four swords that really stand out as good options for phase one. That's the gladiator sword, the spike blade, the world boss sword, and blink strike, which is going to be a very expensive world BOE. That's literally the only options a rogue has to do, to do good sword damage with their main hand, essentially. Other than that, they're looking at blue options, at maces. It, it's not pretty. This is the most accessible of the four by a country mile and is very close to the other three in terms of the sims. So this is strictly a rogue prio. Obviously, your fury warrior can use this effectively as well because they can use swords. It's a pretty slow weapon, but it's just not as good for them as it is for rogues. Warriors get to use something like Decapitator, which is slightly better, especially if you are an orc. Interestingly though, as a small joke, but also in all seriousness, in case a hunter tries to pull this, obviously some hunters might not have got the fist weapon memo. Some hunters might just want to look cool don't give this to a hunter. It's not completely trash, but being back mounted is really not a reason for a weapon to go to you. And like, it's an awesome looking weapon, at least in my opinion. It sheaths on your back, but it, 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 this is a rogue item. All right, so on to Nightbane now. And this first item is a little bit of a meme item. The problem with it is that it has an internal cooldown of 50 seconds. Therefore, it's pretty poor even when you compare it to pre-raid options. It's pretty much a void crystal unless there's some sort of quirky way to abuse it on trash packs. Since the proc is pretty reliable, you just need a super short encounter to abuse it in. So maybe some crazy trash strategy in speedrunning could be a thing with like gear swaps and stuff. I have no idea, but this is probably a void crystal for the most part. Stonebow Joker, Jerkin, sorry, Jerkin, Jerkin, um, is definitely Druid Pride just because of the spirit factor ahead of Shamans and Paladins, but this item is worse than Tier 4, than both the crafted exclusive chests for leatherworking and tailoring, so it's not super important. If the healer in question has neither leatherworking or tailoring, and you've yet to clear Magtheridon, or they're still waiting for the Tier 4 chest, this is a decent option, it's pretty good. Speaking of decent options that you might not think are particularly decent, again, particularly given the lack of sockets, contradicting that trend of no socket items sucking real hard, 
This chess piece is okay. It provides decent value over most dungeon options for ferals, rogues, and enhancement shamans. I wouldn't class prior this because it's you know not a super important choice, but it certainly is not a void crystal in the early weeks. Scaled Breastplate of Carnage. Similar to most other node gem socket pieces, this is kind of bad. This one is not like Chess Guard of the Conover. This is a void crystal by and large. Ferocious Swift Kickers, quite a bit worse than Edgewalkers from Morose and Fiend Slayer Boots from Chess Event, so dunk them on anyone reasonable. Just don't think too much about them. They're okay, they're okay, but just not that great. This brings us to Panzerthar Breastplate now, and this is the second best chess piece for both prop tanks, but is definitely inferior to tier 4 for both. More of a transitional piece, and it doesn't really matter who gets it first. It is exceptional for mitigation though. It is arguably better than tier 4 for mitigation for both specs. So this is definitely an item you are hoping to see twice, at least if you're running with the same 10-man group and there's a both prop warrior and prop paladin I guess. I guess you would split them actually so a bit stupid for my part but either way you're hoping to see these on your tanks pretty early on as you head into Grohl's and Magtheridon because Magtheridon is actually like he slaps a little bit you know so this would be great to get on your tanks early. Iron Striders of Urgency. Now this is essentially the item that pushes plate wearers down Edgewalker long boots. This is going to be a little bit better than Edgewalker long, boot, Edgewalker long Boots, particularly if hit isn't a problem. And in both cases, of both Warriors and Paladins, it's probably fine for hit. It's not too hard to get hit capped as either of those specs. So on average, this is your best option. And essentially, it's it's only can go to them, right? So happy days. Ember Spur Talisman is essentially the best mp5 neck that we can get our hands on in this phase and because it's mp5 as opposed to spirit it is going to be a slight priority to shamans and paladins particularly shamans they love mp5 whereas holy paladins you know they like the throughput from the 66 healing but you know holy pounds are pretty damn good on mana regardless so overall shamans and paladins maybe a slight edge to shamans now in terms of throughput specifically, your priests and druids might want this too. They might think, ah, my mana's fine, I don't need the teeth of Grohl, I want this. Sure, but you you would still put them lower than shamans and paladins, because teeth of Grohl is pretty poor on shamans and paladins. So, with that in mind, there is that prior to the chonkier of the healers. Talisman of Nightbane is a decent offhand, very similar to when we discussed the Jewel of Infinite Possibilities. It's got a good role player sort of aspect to it in the early weeks, but once the badges are rolling in, once everybody is gearing up a little bit more effectively, this sort of just falls away in terms of its value. So ultimately, don't think too hard on this one. Just, you know, pick the best candidate based on what they currently have equipped because eventually they will replace it. Nightstaff of the Ever Living, and this is this is again a, a bit of like an awkward one, but a very very nice item. One hand and offhand typically excels more in TBC, but this is a nice staff for priests and druids in particular because of that very very chunky spirit on it. It's also fine for shamans. I would lean towards just where the biggest upgrade is, generally speaking. But obviously there is that slight spirit or actually large spirit aspect to this one because druids and priests you know can abuse that pretty well for regen notably though you know it might come down to who wants it for arena now typically you're going to use a one hand in arena two but in like the mana war games where resources are important maybe you're playing like you know warlock druid mirrors where it's like really long term quite a long matchup the spirit on this is going to be pretty useful in Season 1 until you can get your hands on something, you know, more suitable later on. So, that might be the sort of tiebreaker question, but all in all, just go with the biggest upgrade. It's again one of those ones where 
whoever gets it might be a tiny bit disappointed because they're probably not getting probably not getting lights justice it does look a little cool i guess a bit like a cthune stave with a little, little rotation so there is that i guess fashion doesn't matter sometimes but all in all it is a tricky one it's pretty good though go with whatever Dragonheart Flame Shield. Now, this is a pretty much a slam dunk. Looks awesome, by the way. Like, just straight up cool. Breathes fire every now and then. It's an elemental shaman shield, right? Like, it's it's got... Uh, sorry, it's got spell damage, MP5, int stam. It's pretty strong. And it looks awesome. I mean, even if this isn't the very best option in terms of th throughput or output, rather, DPS... Ellie Shamans are gonna gonna want to wear this, but it is the best option as well. So it's awesome. Give that to your Ellie Shamans. Outside of that, your prop paladin may want to use it for farming or threat sets, though this is a little early to be foregoing a defensive shield, at least broadly speaking, without seeing how everything plays out in the classic iteration. But from experience. Phase one is a little bit early to start, you know, whipping out a flame shield as a prop paladin. Speaking of shields, though, for prop paladins, this is the second best shield for phase one. Essentially, it's not completely amazing. The Grohl shield is quite a bit better because just the the stats are a bit a bit better. The block value is kind of eh, like it's good, but mm, whatever. Um, it does look awesome though. A bit of a fun fact, a bit of trivia, if you're a fan of this channel. This is, for some reason, when I was I was very young when TBC released, and this shield, for some reason, really caught my fancy. I was desperate for this shield as a young prop paladin. No idea why, I thought it looked awesome, and it's one of those things that I just always look at and go, yeah, I remember this one, I remember this one. Um, so yeah, may maybe a little not prior on this one, if I've got a little prop paladin ult or a prop warrior ult, but... Overall, this, this can go either way, Prop Warrior or uh, Prop Paladin. It's very good either way. They're both going to be looking forward to the Grohl Shield, though, later on. This brings us to the chess event loot now. And Headdress of the High Potentate is essentially one of these items that, without the Meta Gem and just fat stats, it's pretty awful. Like... The fat stats aren't fat enough, you know? Like, the chunk is not chunky enough. It, it doesn't really make up for the lack of Meta Gem socket here. So don't class prior this. Just put it on whoever has, you know, not the best setup right now. I um, guess it looks okay as well. So there is that. Now, this one's a really interesting one. When I first looked at this, I actually, you know, looked into, like, the EP values and most specs, this doesn't look too great. Um, then I started looking at some sims, looked at like the value it has broadly speaking and actually it's a pretty good item now that I had to take a little bit of a deep dive on this one to really get a better picture because my initial impression it appeared to me that it wasn't that competitive but actually as far as the early game goes where you know maybe you're not clearing grolls this week maybe it's week one and you know you're just trying to get stuff in or if you're a slightly less aggressive guild in terms of progression maybe you just haven't got to grolls yet in general whatever week it is this item is very good for a couple specs. The outlier in particular being Enhancement Shamans and potentially your Warriors too, but definitely the Enhancement Shamans. The reason why Warriors aren't as high is because Rage Steel, a crafted shoulder, is very similar and you can obtain a two-piece very easily with the Rage Steel set, which provides a little bit more value. So Enhancements actually do quite like these shoulders. If they're not already you know in the territory of using tier four or the waste walker shoulders for the two-piece bonus which you know is simming pretty well for a number of melee specs at the moment particularly the ones that you know can use that over hit cap or over soft hit cap hit rating they're pretty interested in that so again the outlier here is enhancement shaman prioritize it there unless they have waste walker two-piece or tier four For context on the other classes, just to give you a better idea though, Frail Druids are more interested in Tier 4 and a couple other options. Hunters are using Beast Lords, Rogues are using Waste Walkers, 
even some enhancements are going to be using waste walkers and as mentioned plate wearers are going to be looking at rage steel a little bit more intensely than this so overall an enhancement item decent item there might be quite a bit of interest early days in this but if you're going to prioritize anyone just on class definitely enhancement Next we have the Girdle of Treachery. Now this is a solid belt, but there are many, many better options, especially for plate users. So if you really feel the need to consider class, prior the leather wearers, but realistically, it's not super competitive. If you look at like the itemization, the sockets are nice, both being red, agility bonus, nice, decent attack power, but that stamina is kind of eating a bit too much of the budget to really push it up there into those you know, high DPS slots that really, you know, tickle your fancy. It's good, but not great. Forest Lord Striders. Now, these are a weak slot for healers, as in the boots. Boots as a general slot is weak for healers. They are the second best boots in the game behind the Kazakh boots for all healers that can use them. So whilst Druids will get a slight priority, because of the spirit, like it's just a little bit more value to be putting it on your druid for the spirit reasons. Don't be too strict here, because unless you're doing well bosses, boots are a rough slot. They're one of those weird slots where you just look at it and go, ah, the options are minimal. And so shamans and paladins are also extremely interested in these boots, and don't be too strict. If you've just given the rest of the druid an item, spirit is not enough because of the limited options, it's not enough to warrant giving it to the Druid right away ahead of your Paladin or Shaman, if, if the context is that the Druid's just got an item. The Shamans and Paladins are very interested in this as well, unless, of course, you're blasting wild bosses, in which case, the prior to Druids would be a tiny bit stronger. But either way, it's exceptional. Heart flame leggings are next. Now, these are awesome for shamans and paladins. They're only beaten by Doomwalker legs or white mend if you have the tailoring set bonus. Paladins have a very similar option from Nightbane in leg plates of the innocent. So shamans do get a slight prio here, but they are great for both. Apologies. Leg plates of the innocent are literally two items away. We'll get to those <laughs> from chess event. My script, my, my notes are wrong. Apologies. Fiend Slayer Boots, you've already heard about these ones. These are worse than Edgewalkers, but they're close enough to cuckold your Enhance and Hunter from the top priority spots on Edgewalkers. For this reason, you're probably looking at Enhance slightly over the Hunter, followed by the Paladins and Warriors. Yes, Warriors can get a little bit of value from these if they haven't been blessed with the Iron Striders. Now, in particular, I want to talk about why Enhance has a very, very slight edge in my my sort of ID, ideology on this. It's purely because we've already discussed how Hunters are slightly ahead of Enhance in the Edgewalker Longboot discussions. So if that is the case, you may as well slightly, you know, err on the side of Enhance here, just for a means of like, if everything dropped in like, a very consistent pattern you, you would want to like spread out loot as optimally as possible and the best way to do that is to mirror the slight edge you're giving hunters on edge walkers with a slight you know edge here for enhance that won't make enhancement mains particularly happy because obviously they would rather have edge walkers but in terms of a macro look at loot maybe that's the play but i could definitely see you know alternative opinions that are like hey man that's bullshit fair enough just, just putting it out there, that's kind of where I would stand on it, but I could definitely see that there's, there can be a very strong difference of opinion there. Now, leg plates of the innocence, or innocent rather. Paladins are the only option, of course. They are also slightly better on EP, at least, from Heart Flame. On throughput, they are not. So, it, it's an awkward one, right? You, you would still put shamans ahead on these Heart Flame leggings, because of the fact that shamans cannot use leg plates of the innocent, but I could totally buy if the pa if holy paladins are like, hey man, screw MP5 and spell crit, we're fine on mana, just give me extra juice in my healing. I could really see that. So whilst these exist, 
I'm not sure they are strictly BIS. On EP they are, but whether that ends up being the practical BIS in terms of like people just going for throughput or mana regen, that argument is where it's going to land. Again, because these exist, you are going to favor your shamans on heart flame, but definitely listen to your paladins if they're saying, hey man, we don't need mana, we, we just want to blast. But either way, these are for your paladins. Battle Scar Boots. Now this is an interesting one because it's actually the easiest prop tank sort of item. Because prop paladins really don't give a damn about strength, they essentially want different boots. They want boots of illusion from trash. They get more value from them despite the lack of sockets. So this is a slam dunk for your prop warrior and your paladin will be waiting for boots of illusion. And the irritating thing about boots of illusion is that they probably don't drop. So it's going to be a little bit awkward for your prop paladin. I remember very strongly doing Karazhan for at least three months every week in TBC on my prop paladin and just not getting boots of illusion. That might just be awful luck, but honestly, they they are a pain in the ass sometimes with the trash drops. So it kind of sucks that you might get cucked a little bit as a prop paladin. These are an okay option if you are getting unlucky, but you definitely would rather have boots of illusion as a prop paladin. <coughs> Next up is Mithril Chain of Heroism. You're looking at DPS warriors here. They get a little bit more mileage out of it. Neck is a very contested slot. There's just so many options that it's hard really to, to I guess, give a damn. For want of a better phrase, for, for physical DPS necks, there's just so many and they're, they're pretty easy to go around. It's a bit like the, um, the cloak situation for casters. You can nitpick here and there, but there's just so many good cloaks that who, who cares? Just, you know, it, it will, everyone will get one. Wish everyone fits your gear set, let's go. You know, like it's, it's a bit of an awkward one. But in terms of who will use this, warriors, potentially paladins as well, rep paladins. And you could see this as a reasonable balanced option for a feral tank if they are getting unlucky with Sabreclaw Talisman from Shade of Iran, I believe it was. Next up is Ring of Recurrence. Now this is one of the most competitive caster pieces in Karazhan, though it's worth noting that rings, much like cloaks, have a lot of options. They even have particularly good options from vanilla. As mentioned on many crit items before, this is going to go to casters in a good hit situation. And in terms of the spec that is going to slam dunk this ring immediately, week one, no problem, is going to be the elemental shamans. They just don't need hit. We've already discussed it. I want to beat, you know, beat the horse on this topic. It, it's, it's an awkward one, right? Because it's clearly very, very good. It is best for most specs, if I'm not mistaken. But... In terms of the hit situation, the spec that's going to get there first is almost certainly the Elemental Shaman. So, that being said, I would maybe go for the first one going to a rest, uh, to an Elemental Shaman, sorry. It's just that that's nitpicking, right? Like, it can go anywhere. Notably, though, you definitely want to consider putting the good rings from Karazhan onto the casters that weren't playing in Vanilla which Alliance side would play into that Elemental Shaman uh, thing that I've just said as well, right? Not only do Elemental Shamans really, you know, avoid hit by and large, and really like crit, at least phase one, they also are not going to have vanilla items, Alliance side. And the vanilla items like the Cthulhu Ring, Band of the Inevitable from Naxxramas, if your casters have those, a lot of the TBC phase one rings are not huge. Like they're better, but they're not huge. So again, prioritize people in the best hit situation. I believe most casters do end up putting this as one of their best rings for phase one. But at the same time, you know, the, the spec that gets there first is almost certainly Elemental Shaman. And in the case of Alliance Elemental Shamans, there's probably an even bigger reason because your Elemental Shaman probably didn't squeeze in you know, some Cthulhu loot or Naxxramas loot in the two weeks we were given to level up to 70. <coughs> King's Defender. This is an easy one. This is a massive sword 
and it is essentially the best one-hander or the best weapon for prop warriors outside of swordsmithing. Blaze Guard is a little bit better just because it gets upgraded to around tier 5 level stats before we get to tier 5, essentially. But King's Offender is really good. Besides that, it's pretty fast. And interestingly, if your rogue has had awful luck in Black Morass, there's a blue called Latro Shifting Sword. It's exceptional. It's almost as good as the Gladiator offhand, despite being 20 DPS lower because of how good the stats are and the speed is. But Black Morass, it's got troll potential, right? It's a relatively annoying dungeon. And a lot of people don't really fancy spamming Keepers of Time rep. Tanks will, but, you know, most people don't really end up doing that. So if they get unlucky on Latros, this is an okay offhand. The same can be said for Fury Warriors. There are much better options, but King's Defender is not a bad offhand. It's fast. It generates those sword procs for rogues. It's pretty good for, you know, getting the extra rage for warriors, though it's you know less relevant than it is for the sword rogue. It, it's okay on those specs. Now, back in the day, um, some prop paladins used to use this because there was a very, very brief period where Seal of Blood was a little bit broken on threat. It didn't last very long, but essentially, don't give this to your prop paladins. A, a, a prop paladins need spell damage weapons. Like, they just do. This, despite looking like a tank weapon, this is only for prop warriors or the offhand of a desperate rogue or fury warrior. That this is not a prop paladin item. Please don't let your prop paladins walk around with this. It, it's pretty dire for a prop paladin. Outside of just the speed being pretty nice. Triptych Shield of the Ancients. Now, this is not the best shield that you'll find in phase one for healers, but it is pretty good. It's got 42 healing, 8 MP5, big, big primary stats. It looks like a recolored gladiator shield, essentially, or maybe the gladiator shields are a recolored version of this. Either way, it's a pretty good shield. Um, the Magtheridon one is better by, what, 11 healing and I think 3 MP5? We'll get to it, so we'll see. But uh, this is an okay, you know, shield by and large. It definitely is, you know, more of a role player item, particularly because in terms of, like, say, alliances, again, with shamans, or Paladins, actually no, or Paladins too, sorry. Either way, right, the, the new classes for each faction, they are going to be in a situation where they probably don't have the KT shield, right? If you've got a guild that's farmed out next in particular, the KT shield's better than this. It's arguably, you know, it's a tiny bit better than the Magtheridon shield, at least on throughput. So ultimately, this is going to probably your brand new class. Like whoever the brand new healer is, be it Paladin or Shaman, depending on your faction, this is one of those easy ones where you shove it on them because they're, they're not benefiting from the KT shield being so oppressively good still. So that's something to be kept in mind. Again, it's just a slam dunk Shaman Paladins. No real prio here because there's not too many shields. Um, if you're really min-maxing, you probably use Tears of Heaven, the non-shield offhand from badges over this. But, I mean, pe people who play Shaman and Paladins, surely they're playing it to, to have shields, right? I don't know. Either way, goes on those two specs. It can be serviceable as a prop paladin shield too. Now hear me out here. It's simply due to the fact that the armor is pretty strong, right? It's got a big armor value, good stamina, good int. It has 14 spell damage on it because of the way healing power works now. 8 MP5 is kind of dead for a prop paladin. But just keep it in mind, it's not completely trash. It's not awful. It, it's okay if you haven't got say shield of impenetrable darkness or or any of the other options i mean it specifically if you can fit it in right like defense rating etc it's hard as a prop paladin but if you can fit it in it's not bad keep an open mind there prince malkas are next and uh this this one's gonna take a little while so get comfy for this boss so staying this cloak no prior here honestly no prior um, it's just because this is the best cloak available in phase one. All the good cloaks follow this recipe of MP5 healing big primaries. That that's just it. That that's how it works in phase one. This is the best option. Simple as that. Looks kind of nice too. 
Now on to Ruby Drape of the Mysticant, and this one's a great cloak. Obviously, put onto specs that are looking to hit cap efficiently and have quite a big sort of gap to fill with their hit. Again, it's an awkward one to say very, very specifically because it's going to fluctuate very, very much based on the hit situations of your casters. For example, if your your um, even if like say your warlock who's typically interested in hit, if they've got hit items everywhere just because of how things have fallen, they're probably not interested in this just yet. It is really good and it might end up, it's going to be best for several specs in terms of their best setup because it's quite a good slot to get your spell, spell hit at. But depending on the current situation on spell hit, that's a bigger driver to my mind. Just because there's so many good cloaks for casters. It's one of those things where you can make a lot of arguments for Biss and Class Pro and who pumps the hardest, etc. But there's so many cloaks, there's such a plethora of supply that it, it kind of pales like in comparison, right? Like it just sort of becomes this, eh, who cares? You'll get a cloak eventually, that's good. And and eventually it's gonna get to the stage where everyone's got the right cloak for them, if that makes sense. But without going too far on this tangent, I do wanna suggest that you potentially lean towards your fire boys, the fire mages, the fire warlocks, they cannot use the gloves from Ataman for their hit because they're using spell fire, assuming they're min-maxing. Big caveat, but assuming they're min-maxing, they've got spell fire equipped. As such, this is kind of that trade-off. They've lost the efficient hit on the gloves because they've got better gloves, so you want to dunk them with this. That's where I would lean towards if you're really trying to find a class prio here. But as mentioned, there's, pardon me, so many cloaks for casters that it's awkward to be too strict on it. Fast Rider Wilder Cloak next. And this one is just an anomaly, like big stamina, big attack power, but not big enough kind of like in terms of the attack power aspect. And it might sneak in to some threat sets for a prop warrior, but honestly, it, it, it's not a competitive item. It's something that people will perhaps want at given stages, but it's not worth spending time on. Like just go with whatever's the biggest upgrade. If it's an upgrade at all, that's a big, big question mark, by the way. It's not a slam dunk. Oh, this is epic. Therefore it's an upgrade. This is a borderline upgrade for certain specs. If anything, even from pre-raid sort of stuff or even leveling stuff, it might be borderline. So keep in mind, it's not a particularly strong item, at least broadly speaking. It might come down to a PVP, early PVP claim. You know, some people might want the chonk even though, you know, resilience is a thing that maybe they haven't got their sergeant's cloak yet. Whatever it is, I'm not entirely sure where this would land. Don't waste your time on it. It's not a massive item. Now, Adornment of Stolen Souls. This is the flip side of the brooch of Unquenched Fury. It's the crit version, essentially. It is, on total budget, probably the best neck available, but obviously a lot of specs need that hit from brooch or the blue brooch that we spoke about from Shadow Labs. To my mind, at least early on, you're gonna be looking at that elemental again. Like, I know it's not that I, I'm not trying to favoritize the elemental shamans, it's just how easy they have hits, whereas other casters just don't have it. Same with arcane mages. If you have an arcane mage in phase one, even a boomy, boomies have balance of power, they probably sit in your elemental group in Tony Five Mans. Their hit, hit situation is pretty good. So lean towards those specs early on because their hit situation is going to improve a lot quicker or is already there. It's already fine. So to my mind, look at the Arcane Mages, the Elemental Shamans, the Boomies early on this one because their hit situation is pretty comfortable. However, again, much like the Cloaks, it's going to be by by a, a person basis, by a gear by gear basis, because taking it in a vacuum like we are trying to on this set of items, these necks, is really awkward. But again, if you have to have some class pro in your mind, do lean towards elemental in particular, followed by you know arcane mage booming. 
those three specs have a pretty nice time with it. Now Jade Ring of the Ever Living. This is essentially Abyss for Shamans as they prefer MP5 over both Intellect and Spirit. But the ring slot is very close across the board in Phase 1 for most healers. Now for throughput specifically, this is the best ring for everybody. So I would only do a very soft priority towards your rest of the shamans. Following this, all three of the other healers also will have an interest in this. It's, again, throughput wise, very strong and ultimately a lot of interest will be here. Though there are several options. The Magtherodon ring, though it's debatable when healers will get that Magtherodon ring because of the, it's like an Oni head, right? Just, it's Magtherodon's head, you trade it in for a ring. Whether the healers get that early is probably you know dubious. So perhaps you know in this case it's this is a very competitive item, but there are several options. So slight shaman prio, but ultimately just a really really good ring. Ring of a thousand marks, and this is essentially you know speaking of a really good ring, just like the jade ring, this appeals to so many like candidates like it, it, it's one of those ones where i looked at it and i dreaded like i dreaded trying to find a way to discern who is best to have it essentially highly contested hunters rogues enhancement shamans and dps warriors you know are all interested and they all replace it in phase two which is an important distinction whilst you can say this is you know the best ring available and and, and be very upset about it not going your way perhaps as a potential recipient of this ring it's important to keep some context this is replaced it's not this you know everlasting awesome ring it, it is one of those ones where it's really good right now less so in phase two but with that said under the circumstances of just like damage class power and, and just like trying to improve the raid as quickly as possible i'd give it to bm hunters as a priority and it's just because it's great for everybody. Like it's one of those ones where it's so good for everybody that the only realistic kind of you know differentiation you can do is just who does the most damage for the raid. As far as remember, this is just the single context. Please don't lynch me here. Hunters go boom. I know it sucks, but hunters do go boom. So here, because it's so tight, I would lean towards your hunters. Obviously. When they last got their last item, you know, are they reliable? All that stuff all comes into it. So it's not a hard prio by any means. But if you have to use class as a contributing factor, hunters should get some priority here because they just slap. From a raid perspective, survival is preferring the agility rings, right? They're going to be looking at the Magtherodon ring, looking at Garona's signet more so. So they should be a little bit lesser compared to the BM Hunters. And maybe, I, I haven't looked at the exact, I don't think there is a, a public sim tool yet for survival. But it would not surprise me if there is a world where they forego ring for the raid. For personal DPS, I'm, I imagine this is the best. But for the raid, I could see a world where they forego it to go with the agility options. Following this though, you've got rogues who are desperate for hit. They're desperate, and you probably only have one. Sometimes it's easier to feed that one mouth real quick to shut him up, as it is to, you know, feed the guy or the three people who are blasting real hard in your 25 man raid. So there is that, and Enhancement also really enjoys, or at least can use, hit that goes over their soft hit cap. So in that sense, Enhancement Shamans are a very good candidate too so i would very loosely now please emphasize very loosely put it as bm hunter followed by enhanced shamans and rogues and then you're looking at your rep palins and worries but this is super close by the way like this is not hard pro this is splitting hairs but then followed by your plate dps and then you've got you know the rest of them and realistically the bottom priority has to be the boy, the feral DPS, I'm sorry. It, it, it's a rare spec. You probably, on average, are going to be asked to tank a lot. The value just doesn't quite match up compared to all these other specs. So that's that's my thoughts on, on this very contested item. It's, again, 
use the other the other metrics. Class is such an awkward one here, but if you have to, BM Hunter into Rogue and Enhance, into your Plate Wearers, into the unfortunate Feral Druids. Nathra's in Mindblade, so we're going from, you know, this is like a three-peat of very uh, difficult ones to discern. And this has got some drama potential, particularly if you are not killing Doomwalker. And this is because it's the only option, basically, for Boomkins, Shadow Priests, and Elemental Shamans to really get a substantial, awesome weapon. Um, because they can't use swords. In, in, in Phase 1, there are two daggers and one sword for one-handers that are all very similar in value. The World Boss one is a little bit better. It has a few gem sockets, pushes it a little bit higher. In terms of if you cannot do World Bosses though, there's literally just this dagger, there's the Grove Sword, and that's about it as far as one-handers go. So if you are super interested in making sure loot is distributed efficiently, not necessarily for initial raid DPS, but just sort of like longer term raid DPS, unless you get absolutely blessed with mind blades, you probably want to lean towards those dagger only casters initially. And it, it's a tough one because elementals, boomkins and shadow priests are not known to be like top pumpers, right? They aren't. You're going to have your warlocks doing more. You're going to have probably your mages doing more pretty much always as well. And in, in that context, it becomes very difficult. But the sword from Grull exists. And obviously, you probably want to split up your casters as much as possible, specifically for this mind blade. Like, out of all the weapons in Karazhan, this is the one. Like, this and Light's Justice are like the two standouts. They, they really are things that are hard to compete with. They're hard to... I mean, even Light's Justice is, is easier. There's Shard of the Virtuous, which isn't too much far away. But in terms of Mind Blade, it's really ahead, pretty much, outside of, you know, you've got Gavel, which is from a rep, from a Lower City Rep, I believe, or Shatar Rep, and is 183 and some crit. So it's not ginormously behind Mind Blade for those specs like Shadow Priest, Boomkin, Elemental, but because of this lack of daggers and the availability of the swords, I would, at the very least, use other factors. I wouldn't use class pro here. Um, if you're doing world bosses though, I would go for the blasters. Like, if there are two sources of daggers alongside the sword the sword from Grohl, I would go for, you know, warlocks do the most, go there first. Stuff like that. I would go along those lines. But if you're not killing world bosses, the, the, the situation for elemental boomkin shadow priest is pretty rough. And in that situation, I'd be far more open to using just other factors, not class prio, just other factors. For example, if week one you clear Grohl's Lair, or week two, or whatever it is, and you get a Bloodmore Magus Blade, I mean, you're really happy because that then takes away one more mouth to feed for this Mind Blade. Like, you're, you're praying for the swords to drop so that you can ease up this sort of like uh, bottleneck for good spell power weapons. Of course, you can bring up the Gavel again. The Gavel is, is pretty good, but it's a whole like 10% or more behind, essentially. So, I mean, it is what it is. I'd be quite open-minded here. I wouldn't go too strongly for class here, unless you're doing world bosses. If you're doing world bosses and there's more more like available options, go for the pumpers, man. Why not? I mean, if there's more loot to go around, you're in a much better position to use that metric. But... For most guilds, use other factors. Use the reliable guy. Use the, the guy who's always helping out. Whatever it is. Who, who hasn't had loot for ages. Like, use those things. Like, this is a really awkward one. But if you really have to use class, yeah, I guess you do go pumpers. But it's a rough one. It, 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 <laughs> I know you came here for, like, maybe some guidance here. But on this one, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I can't help you here too much. This this is just me rambling at this point, so I'm going to move on. But it's a tough one. Malkazine. This one is pretty cool looking. And essentially is for your Dagger Rogue main hand, which is, you know, 
arguably not going to exist. Like you, you might not have a dagger rogue ever. And if you don't, this is not too bad in the offhand of a fury warrior. That, that that's about it. Off spec afterwards, you know, probably pretty good for early arena too. In fact, I imagine until you get a gladiator um, dagger, this is pretty decent. I imagine, but then again, you're looking for the slow hemo weapons anyway. So yeah. <laughs> There's no use case for this outside of Dagger Rogue for PvE or Offhand Fury. Now, the Decapitator is an interesting one. This is going to go straight away as the Abyss option for your non-Blacksmith Enhances and Fury Warriors. And in particular, your Orcs, obviously, for the expertise from Axes. It is quite substantial. You would rather give them this first and give the Fool's Bane to the non-Orcs just to min-max the raid performance sooner. You don't necessarily have to take that approach, but it definitely makes a lot of sense from a purely numerical standpoint. Outside of this though, there aren't too many use cases. Um, it, it, it's pretty much Enhanced Fury. 2.6 is a nice weapon speed, and it, it kind of helps out this really awkward problem that Enhance have. I won't go too much into it because this video is really long, but ultimately Enhance and Fury Warriors are going to get the prior, probably more so Enhance, just because they have less options, and definitely Orc prior, definitely Orc prior. Gorehound next, and for all the RP uh, fans, uh, I got some bad, bad news. Um, th this is a ret, ret item. Like, if you're not a swordsmith, this is, pr I think this is the best two-hander for ret. Um, I might be mistaken there, but it, this is definitely more powerful in a Retribution Paladin's hands than a Warrior's hand. And, and the reason for that is, is that Armour's Warriors really need that sword spec to start slapping real hard. Um, axe spec is not completely trash. If you have a really bad two-hand sword, this is fine for Arms Warrior. I'm not saying it's not good. I'm just saying that it's not a sword. And because it's not a sword, it really favours Rep Paladin in terms of min-maxing the usage of this weapon so sadly <laughs> you're gonna have to wait a little while before you're the warrior wielding gorehow for rp in shatrath because quite frankly if neither of your two hand wielders are blacksmithing this is the ret paladin's weapon all right lights justice we've touched on this one already it is bis for all healers like just flat out all healers it is, you know, around 10% better in terms of healing than Shard of the Virtuous. So not crazy, crazy big, but, you know, it's noticeable. It's importantly, you know, ahead, significantly ahead to some degree. Min-maxers, you know, care a lot about 10%. The reason why, you know, I said about the Shard of the Virtuous thing is because of spirit. And, and it, it's a loose thing, right? It's bis for all. Um, however... The Light Fathom thing from Vash is kind of where I would lean from a guild management perspective. Remember, macro, macro level look. I would put this on Priests and Druids first, just because of the spirit and because you're going to value the Light Fathom on your Shamans and Paladins more so than your Druids and Priests, despite Light Fathom being the Phase 2 Biss. It's just how it be, essentially. So... To, the, to my mind, it's a slight prior to Priest and Druid. Obviously, you might not have, you know, like Priest and Druid potentially, like either of them. One, the Druid might have it, and there might be no Priest in the raid. Therefore, hey, give it, is the Biss, is the Biss weapon. But in terms of like, if you have to make a really difficult decision, if it's really close, similar kind of like features, similar gear level, similar reliability, all that jazz, definitely lean towards the Spirit users here, because you're going to, you know, pay it forward in regards to the Light Fathom Scepter later on for your Shamans and Paladins. Next up is Sun Fury Bow, Sun Fury Bow of the Phoenix. Now this thing looks pretty badass in my opinion, and it is the best weapon for Hunters all the way up to Lady Vash's uh, bow, I believe. I know that there's a gun in Tempest Keep that's pretty good as well, but I believe this edges everything besides the bash bow I'm, I'm not a hunter expert so you might want to you know double check that but this is the best sun fury this is the best bow 
or ranged weapon regardless for hunters now i'm again not a hunter hunter theory crafter but from what i understand the speed implications of some fury bow put this slightly ahead of wolf slayer even if you're a dwarf if, if you're a hunter theory crafter like a sisley or watch your six or you know from their 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 own mouth from discord put it in the comments because last i checked this is the best hunter weapon regardless of race by a pretty decent margin so this is your best hunter weapon so hunters obviously get it first i'm not sure i would discriminate between bm or survival particularly if you run three hunters in your 25 man group if you run three the difference is is going to be kind of like eh who cares like just go with just a hunter and use the other factors if you run four hunters in your 25 man group then perhaps just perhaps you should lean towards the bm hunters because the survival hunter is going to be in the group in, in a group without too many buffs which is a sad life to be honest but if you run four bm slight prior if you don't run four and you run three or less go with just whoever's the most deserving for whatever other context you want to use and this brings us to now some this now brings us to the tier four helm tokens which are definitely more competitive than the glove tokens in terms of the fallen champion it can be broken into three broad tiers the highest priority tier are specs that just don't have any close alternatives when considering their best setup or setups if they're extremely close for elemental shaman not only is tier 4 helm their best helm over all other options but the two piece is pretty impactful given that they're going to be in a group with three warlocks typically so you're essentially gaining 60 spell damage or 80 no sorry 100 spell damage because of five people but 60 spell damage to specifically your warlocks and your warlocks are your, your big boys right so ultimately this is a really impactful set bonus in terms of prop paladins they're a little bit like feral druids they love the itemization of their tier set compared to the available options in phase one and it's not remotely close following this rogue is also clinging on in this bracket but definitely third of the three because the two piece is quite important to them it's an individual like quality of life thing slash dps increase so it's not quite as important as perhaps your tank getting better or the elemental shaman buff but it is noticeable it is a pretty good set bonus and it is the most efficient way for a rogue to obtain the two set bonus so your rogue is kind of third out of three in that top bracket and the reason for this also is because there's some close alternatives just on standalone item performance if you disregard the rogue's set bonus so they're not really gaining on two axes they're gaining on a singular bonus axis rather than where elemental are gaining a sort of double dip as are the prop paladins in the next bracket is resto shaman rep palette and holy paladin now if world bosses are in play you'd probably have the rep paladin slightly ahead of resto shaman and holy din because the kazakh helm is pretty spicy for throughput and you know the, the two piece especially uh, in terms of like the healing ones are just they're good and they're useful and they're impactful but you know they're, they're healing bonuses at the end of the day and if the content is easy which most of phase one is you know they can wait essentially because phase one probably isn't going to test mana bars too much another small caveat for the healers is that white mend is pretty good and accessible in this slot for both healers even if you're not a tailor it still holds up pretty good and as such again lowers the sort of reason to push them too high on prior however there's a really interesting thing with resto shamans if you're looking at the macro performance of uh, of the raid your resto shaman can effectively run the elemental two-piece bonus over two resto pieces in the exact same slots for not a gigantic drop in performance for healing but obviously gains the elemental 20 spell damage boost and this is a very good thing for your raid composition if you're you know doing that i think it's a sick like the six healer comps are going to have a resto shaman with your shadow priest 
I think one or two mages, and that in itself gives ample reason in terms of raid DPS to want to try and abuse that elemental setup as a resto shaman. So if that's how your raid fits into the group composition, it's a really good thing. Like it's a really good choice. Obviously, it's not the best choice for their individual performance, but if they are undertaking that raid level macro level sort of boost from the two piece elemental set you would push that resto shaman up to the elemental bracket right up into that top priority bracket because the 20 spell damage across three to five players is big like it's really good like as far as a set bonus is concerned given that the gap in performance is not gigantic so keep that in mind if your resto shaman is really a blaster for the raid perspective this is where you would push them up in priority, essentially. Red Paladins love their Tier Helm 2 uh, as part of securing their 2-piece and potentially 4-piece bonus. And the reason I say potentially is because there's no Sim tool yet. So I'm kind of kind of like we wary of like saying anything too strict about Red Paladins. However, similar to the caveat on Rogue in bracket 1, there are some pretty decent alternatives until the token is a little less contested. So to my mind, they're definitely a little less or, or lower on the bracket two priority, assuming that you're not doing world bosses. But if you are, then I'd probably put them a little bit ahead. Finally, you've got Enhancement Shaman and the tier four helm isn't awful and can be used as part of decent setups to obtain their two-piece bonus, which is a nice bonus for raid DPS. It's not a personal DPS increase compared to just wearing the flat-out personal items, if that makes sense. If you replace the two tier items with the very best personal DPS items, it's not better for them to use the totem, the totem bonus, but for your raid, it is. So, in this case, it, it might be... One of the considerations, they might be looking to use tier 4 helm as part of the two set bonus, but they do have several, or there is at least one better standalone item for Enhance, which is the Malefic Mask of Shadows. And as far as I am told, a the best route to get the two-piece bonus is shoulders and chest. So that's why Enhancement's on the lower end here and doesn't have quite as much priority as the other specs. So next up, we've got Helm of the Fallen Defender. Now, this one is a lot easier, and it follows a very similar theme. And I, and I promise you, it's not because I'm going to main Feral Druid. This is just the gods on his truth. Feral Tanks should get a hard prior on this one too. The gap is enormous. It, it's just... Just check out 70 upgrades. You don't even need a Sim tool. Like, just look at the EP difference. It will rapidly improve your threat situation and chonk situation on that feral druid so you pretty much always go feral first here it is just one of those things like it makes so much sense that unless your feral tank is a complete asshole or just doesn't turn up to raids or whatever it is there would need to be a really good reason not to give this to your feral druid first following this though you're looking at your warriors all three specs want this helm as part of their abyss phase one helm and I think this is best decided between your warriors and other factors. But if you're purely looking at raid performance, improving as fast as possible, tank prio makes some sense, as you don't want threat to be a limiting factor, nor do you want Magtheridon to be daddying your potential main tank as the only challenging encounter in phase one. Both Holy and Shadow Priests can use tier four helm, but should be on a lower priority as both have better or similar crafted options even as non-tailors. If they have tailoring, tier 4 helm is a lot worse due to the set bonuses that they can achieve. When it comes to helm of the fallen hero, this is a, this is a fun one. This is just doesn't matter almost. And it, it comes down to some pretty funny factors. So thanks to spell strike hoods and the fact that hunters are using beast lord helmet all the way to tier 5, this token literally has no serious demand. It has no demand for players that are already min-maxing as hard as possible. Now, I know that's not everybody. So that's where the fun part comes in. 
give it to the broke mage or warlock that is currently crying about how expensive tailoring is. That's pretty much my summary. That's what I wrote in my notes. That's where I would go. That's not a slight, by the way. Tailoring is probably going to be expensive, and I fully sympathize. But if you receive this as your, as a major warlock, uh, it's because you're the guy who, who you know is, has been saying how hard it is to get together the gold. It is what it is. Shit happens. But um, yeah, this one has no min-max demand. Put it that way. So now we're on to trash, finally. Getting towards the end of Karazhan, and, and God forbid when we get to Grohl and Maxeridon, but we're going to soldier through. So first things first, Drape of the Righteous. It's uh, Shokadin? I mean, it's going to go to your Paladin of some kind, um, but it's just n not having any chonk on it makes it bad for uh, Prop Paladin. And in terms of Holy... I guess it kind of works as a healing cloak if you haven't got a good one. Oh, sorry, no, it's just damage done. Sorry. Yeah, no, forget that. That's Shockadin all over. I'm not sure quite how good Shockadin is. I think Shockadin gets a lot better in Wrath. But I guess if someone wants to make it work. Grass with the Dead. This is Frost Mage Omega Lol, if you have one of those. The only nice bit about this is that they have that Tier 3 Warlock look, which is pretty cool. But other than that, this is an item that... um. Yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, I, I'm not sure if Frost Mage in PvE will exist for nearly all guilds, but if they do, this is where it goes. Inferno Waste Cord. Um, this one is pretty good. The problem is there are some better options, even for the Fire Boys. Like, this would go to a Fire Warlock or a Fire Mage, but there is certainly just better options. It's not extremely far away from the best option, so... You definitely want to calculate it in as a factor when you decide upon, you know, future belts. But it's not the best, but obviously to your fire boys. Now, this this is the one I've been dreading in the trash section, at least. And it is Grips of Deafness. Now, the biggest problem with this one was the lack of sim tools for some specs. Warriors and Rep Paladins do not have a functional sim tool and a couple other specs have a sim tool that isn't as verifiable as perhaps or as vetted i want to say by by like super smart people as perhaps we would like and it's because early days right this is before launch before pre-patch so you know kind of my bad i guess in that respect but you know you've got to be prepared for these things so i thought i'd get it out there but before me before i ramble um, the big thing here that I want to dispel is the rogue sim tool is really good. Like it, it looks pretty damn accurate as far as, as most people can tell. There doesn't seem to be any not much doubt in regard to the math and how it works, etc. So in this sense, whilst you would initially think rogues will be all over this, and I have when I initially brought this up to people I know that are rogues, they were like, what really? Um Rogues use Waste Walker set because they really interested in hit bonus, the hit bonus from the two piece Waste Walker. They're using Waste Walker shoulders and gloves in their Abyss setup. I have mentioned it before already, but I just wanted to emphasize it here. This means that they're kind of not on the menu for grips. Grips are going to be so rare because of a trash item drop, unless they buff the drop rate. From what I remember, trash drops were not extremely common. They just weren't. Um, a bit like, you know, and then if you if you guys played AQ in Vanilla Classic, how many how many good trash drops did you get per raid? Usually like one or zero, like almost never. So they're quite rare. And given that, and given the fact that rogues sim better with Waste Walker, you're probably disregarding them, unfortunately. Now in terms of where this is best, um, it's going to be leaning towards Enhancement Shaman. At least from what I can tell so far. And I do want to caveat this heavily, heavily with the fact that there is no really good sim tool for warriors or rep paladins yet. The enhanced one looks a, a little tiny bit like, I, I don't know, I would like more verification on the enhancement stuff. But there is at least a sim tool for enhancement. And it also has, you know, this sort of, good reasoning like even 
without looking into the sim tool, just the reasoning of how many attacks a, a, a enhancement shaman does, much like a rogue, the only problem being that rogue wants to use waste walker is that you know grips are extremely good on enhance. Now, besides that, warriors and rep paladins are probably extremely interested in this too. The problem is, is not only the sim tool thing, but also martial perfection gauntlets or gauntlets of martial perfection, they exist. They're very good. They, they, they are so much more stat budget than grips of deafness that despite not having expertise, the fact that they have gem sockets, massive crit, they have strength, and they're just so much higher in stat budget that they kind of overwhelm, potentially, they potentially overwhelm the benefits of expertise. And that's where my doubt comes from, right? I think, at least on EP, martial perfection are extremely close to grips for both Ret and the Warrior DPS specs. So to my mind, even if grips come out ahead, you're going to lean away from your plate wearers just because of the fact that martial perfection gauntlets exist. Then there's also the feral DPS question, or sorry, the feral question in general. These are the best for feral DPS that you can get. They are also the best for feral threat that you can get. Now, it's worth noting that the, the tier four gloves are also very good for a balanced setup for your feral tank. So, you can easily put ferals in the same kind of bracket as the plate wearers, giving Enhance kind of a free ride here. Now I know a lot of people are going to be dubious about the whole waste walker thing with rogues, but really the math checks out. So in this sense, surprisingly perhaps, I would prioritize Enhancement Shamans here. But other factors matter too. Anyway, let's move on before someone like you know has an aneurysm about these weapon these gloves because they are definitely contested. We've got Zirhut's Lost Treads. Now, these are really good for mitigation on a bear. Really good on mitigation. They are not Edgewalker long boots though. Like Edgewalker long boots are good enough that you're looking to include them. Like you can kind of see it on my character already, right? In an aggressive set, or even a mostly defensive set. Edgewalker long boots usually sneak in. They're they're really good. So unless you're really scared of getting like destroyed by a boss, you're probably using edgewalkers. But this is a feral only kind of item, right? Like look at it. It maybe has some value early on for plate wearers like the rep paladins, maybe even enhanced shamans if if people are struggling. But it is pretty much only a feral item, and it's probably a void crystal if the feral already has them or already has long boots. And doesn't feel like needing these. Belt of the Tracker is bad. Boots of Illusion, Prop Paladin Biss, send it to the Prop Paladin. Ritzin's Lost Pendant, so this is your Shadow based Warlocks and Shadow Priests, and in particular, I would lean very heavily on the Affliction Warlocks and the Shadow Priests. Just because of that thing where we discussed, hit and crit aren't too great for them. They work, but they're just not as valuable. The nice 51, huge sh uh, shadow damage, that, that's where you're going with this one. Go to your Shadow Priest and your Affliction Warlocks. Then if they're happy with what they have, then start looking at perhaps your Shadow Based Destro Locks. But honestly, go for Athlee and Shadow Priest, throw them a bone. They're not going to get too many prios in life, so definitely prioritize them there. Ring of Unrelenting Storms is a slam dunk elemental ring. Boomies might have a use case with some niche RAS stuff, but this is undoubtedly no no like no doubt, no doubt, zero doubt. Straight to your elemental shaman, no thought. You don't even need to discuss it with anyone. Slap it on an elemental shaman. The only reason you have a discussion about this one is if you had two elemental shamans in the group. 